I mean, it's going to be a good show, or yes. there's just a lot to talk about. There's a lot to talk about, and it means there's going to be a lot um, of arguing. A lot of arguing, yeah. When you can't even <laughs> stop talking for the 20 seconds that Be Free runs to start the show, Todd Frazier back in the house today. Hey, Todd Father, we had Jason Kipnis make his debut on Monday. I I, I saw him, man. He's a beast. He's a natural. I love how'd, it. He's, how, he's how'd got he good do? insight. How do you do? He did, I think he did well. I think he did What was your well. favorite what, thing you that he said? Were you quizzing him to see if he was watching? I know he wasn't watching. So <laughs> what was, was his favorite thing he said? My father's in the slack even on days off. He's a beast. Wait, I, I can't hear you guys. He had a nice backwards hat on. That's what I saw. It was, I was driving. Nothing I could do. That seems to be the thing, Kratty. Like, you joined the fraternity with a backwards hat besides me, but I didn't play. It's okay, and you got smashing hair. You don't need a hat. If you wear a hat, that's a disservice to whatever is going on up there. Yeah, I don't look a, good in the back. He's got a bathing suit on right now, though. So I, I don't even. I don't know. You what's see going the bathing on. suit? Uh, uh, I got to move in. No, you <laughs> don't. <laughs> no, we could see it before you sat down. Oh, oh! I was like, wait, you could. You see did it have your shot. leg up though on the table at one point, which is a little bit weird. That is not true at all. That <laughs> yeah. is. He, he had his leg like. I can't even do it. That You're, is very flexible, You're very flexible, Scott. You're very flexible. Never put my leg on the table. On never, the chair. Never do that. No. On the chair. That is fiction. Is oh, on the chair. Yeah, on yeah. the chair. Not okay. on the Scott desk. can sit. Scott's the only one on this show that can sit crisscross applesauce in his chair. I do that quite frequently. <laughs> I've got like I've got weird flexibility. Anyway, he just we have crisscross applesauce. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got kids. We have Ken Rosenthal doing his usual thing with us in Fair Territory episode two launched yesterday so we'll talk to ken about how that went and get through a lot on stolen bases he's got word on on what the yankees are doing specifically on that front and the arizona diamondbacks basically barely get caught on how the mets are trying to be the dodgers but then they're not really the dodgers and then ross stripling's going to join us regular on the show to uh pop in and i think aj is going to quiz him on on gabe kapler because you played with gabe right i played with gabe yes numerous okay. numerous times and gabe is just Vanilla ice cream, same as everyone else. Doesn't stand yeah, out. Yeah, Gabe at all, is totally right? doesn't say or do he anything strange out. at all. No, no, same guy. <laughs> yeah, if you don't know Gabe, and his he's got a lot of quirks, so yes. I can't wait to ask Ross if he's discovered any of them yet. That's exactly what I put in the question bank. I was like, Gabe Kapler's quirks with Ross Stripling. Ninety-seven Honolulu Sharks, Hawaii Winter League champs, champs baby. They only put that banner up to block what was going on in the dorms. Anyway, <laughs> Phil Nevin, <laughs> Phil Nevin, uh, Angel Skipper. Also joining us, excited to talk to Phil. Who's the most excited? Kratzy, would it be you? Are you the closest with him out of all of us? Uh, I don't know how much AJ knows him, but I played for him as a bench coach. And yeah, he's he's a guy. And he's definitely, we'll get into it. I think he's more jacked than Gabe, but we'll have to get into that. He oh, definitely wears, he's, fat, he's definitely fatter than Gabe. Oh, he de- whoa. Wow. Who oh, wins in know. a fight? Who wins in a fight? Gabe Kapler or Phil Nevin? And obviously well, I'm going to fight. Phil. Phil's going to fight dirty. 
and Gabe's not? No. Wow. Two we need accusations to ask him this now. Because that would be I'll like that would be like two mongooses going at it. I, I feel like <laughs> Phil definitely I mean, listen, my wife doesn't call Phil filthy Phil for no reason. I mean, let's <laughs> that, let's let's get down to it here. <laughs> now that's three accusations. Keep that's going. Not a, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> These aren't accusations. I've known Phil for twenty plus years. I mean So AJ <laughs> might know him better. We've gone on vacations together. I'm, I think I'm writing I these down, well. so I'm writing these down so I can tell them. Okay. I, I am. I'm not even kidding, Todd. I, I put it in the uh, in the Google Doc in the rundown, so I've got them all in. Who's well, going to win a fight between him and Gabe? He's going to say him. And if I mean, listen, if you, you guys know him, who wins in a fight? Gabe Kapler or Phil Nevin? Phil, because Phil's going to fight dirty. How? Pratt, do you agree? Well, I mean, I would agree. Name. Phil Phil's going to he's going to he'll he'll go rage monster. Yeah. Do we have Gabe to put that up like, as a poll? Because that would, for most people, they would feel like that's an upset. Most people have not been around Phil Nevin in person. When I say most people, I say fans. Mm-hmm. Like if that becomes an Instagram or a Twitter poll, I guarantee you, Gabe Kapler wins at least seventy something to you know thirty. Have something. you heard Phil talk? <laughs> he's chewing rocks and he's like, well, the show and my trout, my trout. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's eating and, rocks all the time. And the other part is, and the other part is, like Gabe fighting Gabe would be like fighting Zoolander. Like partway through the fight, they'd be like, rah, rah, and he'd be like, <laughs> "Listen, Gabe has pictures. I mean, on the internet of himself when he was a bodybuilder and like thong man." Speedo, whatever you want to call him. Sure. Phil Nevin's not rocking that anytime soon. And but that doesn't make him That's Phil's going to win better in a because value. Phil's going to get dirty. Uh, Gabe's like, you might ruin my perfect tan, <laughs> my twelve pack abs. Well, I'm gonna, I'm going to after this show send a note to Gabe just to make sure that he defends himself in a okay. scenario. Like well, this. I, this will be his response. Oh, AJ was on there. Of course, he said that. That'll be his exact. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, cool. Well, let's lead things off here because we have about 15 minutes until we bring on Mr. Rosenthal, but I am now even more excited to talk to Phil Nevin in a bit. So if you come on this show, good chance, good things are going to happen. Example A, Nico Horner, hours after joining us live on foul territory, hits his first career walk-off knock and then gets the cowboy hat to celebrate it as well. And it was a nice piece of hitting. Jared Kelnick, Tied up the game in the ninth inning against the Cubbies, made it 2-2. And if you're watching on YouTube right now, the Cowboy look working for the Stanford grad. I don't know if he graduated, but he went there. And uh, Nico took a spinner off the plate and went opposite field off Matt Brash and won it for the Cubbies. You know what that hat looks like? It looks like some Jersey guy came down to Florida for spring break, and they're like, woo I got my, my hat on for spring break. <laughs> hey, you, Snooki, you talk you like you've had that experience. Have uh, you experienced some of those people? I, I, you get you get one you get one ding an episode. The next one, I'm gonna jump up, jump your bones. So that's fine. That's <laughs> one. I'll let how you get that a, one ding. How, how is that a ding? You're from Jersey. Scott's from Jersey. No. And then you guys come down to Fort Lauderdale or Daytona Beach, and you're like, Listen, oh, we're, I give one warning. I give one warning. The next one is <laughs> over. Then you got a problem. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, but uh, Nico Horner, great contact hitter, too, I will say. Great player. Great interview yesterday, too. And great happy interview. for him. Uh, I mean, except for he plays for the Cubs. but Well, that was my thing. But And, and another great shot of, of Nico celebrating afterward. Are the Cubs a playoff contender? No. No. Not even a wild card. Con- like, no. in mid-August, no. you, th- nothing matters when the Cubs are playing. When, no. when is the last time the Cubs are playing a game where you're like, oh, this could actually mean something? Oh, June. June! Wow. They're not their pitching for me is not good enough. Shots fired. You think their season's done by June? Like June, they're ten well, games I mean, back. Listen, they yeah, they might be, oh, we're eight games back of the third wild card. In June. I mean, that's well, a, they'll be in a quick it, but, plunge. but I just don't think that their their pitching's not good enough. I don't think it's deep enough. I don't know if their bullpen's good enough. I mean, Strowman's got off to a great start. Smiley pitched well last night. Um Tyon's been okay. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think they're they're they're, they're fine. They're, they're going to be a 500 team, and if that gets you the third wild card, then hey, congratulations. Yeah, but that would mean they'd be playing meaningful ball through September. If they're if you're a 500 team and you're the third wild card, I mean, good for you. Good on you. Yeah, they're playing. I think. Yeah. I think they're going to have a better record than the other team in Chicago. Hmm. You get one. That's a ding. <laughs> you get one. <laughs> That's why I said it. <laughs> Do you actually believe that? There's no I way. You, I don't. I was trolling. 
I was trolling. <laughs> I, you know, I think I think they'll be in it. I think they'll be in it because, like last year, if you look at the teams that were out of it by the end of August, there was still, you know, in the National League, you're going to still be if you're right at 500, you're going to be within those three or four games of the third wild card, and that's that's going to be enough to keep your fans going. Like if you're if you're one series away from being in a wild card spot, three games back, whether I think three games is a lot more than what you know I think fans think it is, but you're always you always think you have a shot. And I think if they have Stroman and Tyon, and you're three games back, you go into a series where you're you know in the end of August, you're like, oh, we could win two or three. We'd be one game back here, and that's all. That's that's what you need as a fan base. I think I think they have the team to do that. Yes, to go into the playoffs, I don't think so. I think that I think they're playing well right now. I, I do. I think they're. It's an exciting team to watch right now. But everybody goes through those ups and downs, and uh, they're coming out a hot start. And and that's it. I I don't believe they'll be a playoff team. They have a couple pieces which I like, but uh, I, I like AJ said the the pitching. Strowman's coming back, doing awesome. And, um, yeah, we'll see. But I, I, I think they're just on a nice little hot streak right now. They're looking good, getting everybody in Chicago excited. What is considered a hot streak? Five yeah. and four to start the year? Now, 10 and 0 is a hot streak, but five and four to start the year? That's not really a hot streak. If but you here's sustain my thing. that. Yeah. I mean, if the Rays sustain 10 and 0, they're 162 and 0. They're the hottest team in baseball history. It's not, it's not a lie. Okay. So here's my thing. Who are they better than in the National League? National League or National League? Central? National League. Well, the Pirates. Brewers. Okay. Who are they better than? Than a playoff contender. Brewers, Cardinals, no. Mets, Phillies, Braves, no. There's five. We haven't even hit Dodgers, Padres, Giants. They're There's right eight. there. They're right there on the cusp. They're close with the Giants. Okay, so let's say they're – and you guys played, and you guys know, you guys wild card era. If you're five games out of the wild card in June, end of June, are you really in it? A third wild card. And let's say the Diamondbacks, who are up to a better start than the Cubs, are ahead of you. The Giants are ahead of you. So you're in, let's say, ninth place for six spots. Are you really in the playoff race? If they're, those teams are bunched together, and also, Frage, give them shit right back. They've won four or five. To me, that's uh, nice the, guy, the guy just loves calling people out. It's fine. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm just it's, asking. It's, it's plenty fine. I'm, 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 I'm ready. I got my shots fired. It's okay. No, I'm not. I'm just asking because no, I, I'm trying to say. Team. I'm trying they're to ask that question. Team. Nobody, ha- I don't have them as a playoff team. Nobody, I've looked at everyone's list that's on the show right now. No if one you, has to make the playoffs. If, if, if they if finish you, 500, it's a good year. For agreed. Them, for sure. I agree. For right? Sure. 500 is a good year for the Cubs this year. I, I guess so. I, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. Making the playoffs is good to me. I, I don't. I don't care about what your record is. I care about making the playoffs. So having a good year is getting in. I don't care if you're below, above 500. You make the playoffs, that's a decent year for me. If you don't do anything, all right. It wasn't the best year. You want to win a World Series, but I think for them making the playoffs would be would be good. 500, okay, so, I, I could care less. So tell me who they're better than. That's kind of what I was asking. I, no, but he's not predicting. Right now, no, I'm right saying, now. I'm saying, so he, but, okay, so the Phillies, no. all those teams are not 500 teams then. If we're if he's saying just get into the playoffs. And we're, he's saying as a player, if you're I understand on the Cubs, that. Of course it's a great – if right. you get into the playoffs, it's always a great year. From our perspective, if you're looking at that roster, you're like – that's not a play. It's short right now. Yeah. I mean, could could they go out and make some trades and do, do some stuff? Yeah. But right now, it's, it's not a playoff team. For Agreed. Me. And I, w- I would just say they're hot right now. Four out of the last five is – is per- I t- I'll take that every every five games, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. What, what, is, of course. what is hot? That's Define hot. What's, what needs to 10 be and 0 for the race? <laughs> they're no, hot. That, yeah, but that's they're too hot. much. Uh, uh, Seven and three is hot. Yeah. If, if, if you look at – Eight and two. Eight and two, seven and three. I was just, I was yeah. saying, eight you're saying two. they won four out of five. They're five and four. So before that, they were what? Yeah, they were not hot. One and four. <laughs> One <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, exactly. One and three. So, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They got I'm something just, going. I think when they. For future and, and, so I can clarify what being hot means. And another thing is, when they, I think they're better team at home. So, when they do play at home, like winning these games, being the last at bat, you know, have a walk off. Playing at home, I think they're, they're going to do a lot better at home, too, especially. Especially with that crowd, man. It, it's buzzing over there. I mean, listen. What's not to be buzzing by the White Sox should be good this year too. So there should be a lot of talking it down. If the if the Cubs can keep doing what they're doing, you know, they're not going to win four out of every five games. Like I said, they're having their start is getting hotter and hotter. Do I think it'll sizzle? I think it'll sizzle. Yes. Like like I said before. 
What about the Arizona Diamondbacks? Because Josh Rojas also joined us on Monday's show, and he also had a game-winning knock. It's just that it came in the first inning with an RBI single. Still counts. He had the clutch difference-making hit, and the Diamondbacks beat the Brewers 3-0. Zach Allen was ridiculous yesterday. His curveball was nuts. 11 strikeouts for him. Actually, our boy Raddy Telez. Did you see that, Kratzy? He struck out on the uh, pitch clock. There's something. There's Two something. strikes on him, and and he he wasn't ready, and he was pissed. Um, <laughs> um said he wasn't alert at seven seconds, and Gallon's picked up two strikeouts already this year on pitch clock violations. He's the one that was on the mound with Machado too. So I don't know. Maybe you guys don't want to face him right now. He, three hitter for the uh, Brewers yesterday, offense wise, and it was two hours twelve minutes for him to shut them out. I think there's. I think there's. I mean, it's obvious. Like. It's either he's doing something like where he's like waiting to get on the rubber and guys are like waiting, but watching both of these situations where he got Machado and because the strikeouts count the same. So he got him and he got, he got Randy. It was like, you know, they needed some time to like, okay, I got to process what I just saw. And I didn't see the previous pitch. I just saw the strikeouts, but processing it sometimes comes when you you know like this dude just threw me a nasty pitch now I got to process it so it kind of the old adage that pitching coaches always say let the hitters tell you how good your pitch is so the hitters are you know they need some time to process it pitch must be pretty good from Gallon. yeah and Zach 11 K's um one walk I mean that's it's a pretty good ratio right there dude I mean what they're doing especially a good brewer team man I I like I said, it's another home. I don't know. I don't understand. When you go to Arizona for some reason, I never I, I played well there, but we never won games. It's something where you got that long trek to get there if you're not, you know, in the West Coast or the West area region. Um, phenomenal. You got Schaefer coming in, getting three strikeouts to finish the game to get the save. And uh, this is like kind of an idea. Everybody's thinking like, ah, oh, the Diamondbacks are going to push them away, the Cubs, this and that. I mean, it, I know it's sample size. I get it. But there's a lot to be excited about during this Major League season. Who, whose roster do you like better, the Diamondbacks or the Cubs? I would go Diamondbacks okay. right now. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I would. I agree. I, but I why, but why, why do you like them? I, well, they're younger. I think their pitching is better. I, I, I Jack Gallon's good. I think they got a little more offensive power, too, as well. Or not power, offensive explosion, I should say. With the base running. <clears throat> well, I think they got good hitters, too. I think the athleticism is the separator for me. Carroll, Rojas, Alec Thomas, uh-huh. Christian Walker's very underrated at first mm-hmm. base. He put up huge numbers last year, if you haven't seen it. Uh, I, I think Gallon, Merrill Kelly's going to be better. I love Chafin, obviously, at the back end of the bullpen. I, I think, and Tori Lovello, listen, is well, you got, And you're forgetting good. about Longoria. Evan Longoria's batting over 400, I think, still right now. So he's, he's dominating. So, it's, like I said, again, I'll say it again. Sample size, right, Eric? But exciting, exciting to see. They're definitely an exciting brand of baseball. There's nobody can deny that. Whether they're no going to win or not, whether it's going to be sustainable, and it's yes. funny, their yeah. highest paid pitcher is Bumgarner. <laughs> like, it, it's it's one of those things. I think I think their bullpen might be a little weak, but I think anybody can say that. You know, if you have a if you have a shutdown closer and Chafin's look like that so far, so. Mm-hmm. Hey, why not? Keep running. <laughs> Keep running. Kratz, all you on the Phillies. Mm-hmm. We'll get to the betting part of it later, but that's the kind of win, correct me if I'm wrong, that even though it's the Marlins can spark a ball club that's been mediocre to start the season and you're going, oh, do they have a World Series hangover? And then you're like, oh, wait, they can smack the shit out of the baseball. I don't know if they have something on – Alcantara or what it is, but I think it was like five runs, six runs, and then yesterday, nine runs. Like, this is not a guy that you come out and you give gives up runs like this. And and granted, he's gonna have starts because he wants to stay in till his 110 pitches, where it might go sideways early, and then you know, he kind of he still goes through six, but man, they put up five, and you're like, okay, that's incredible. And then they put up another four off them. Like, that's awesome. But for a team, they almost scored too many runs. I'm not sure. I think Wheeler's pitching tonight for them. He might have been on the in the dugout like, all right, guys, like, 
pump the brakes. Like, let's save some for tomorrow. But <laughs> no, Nola's chucking tonight, Crouchy. Oh, Nola's chucking. Okay, Nola's throwing tonight. I knew one of those guys was, but he's, you know, he everybody needs some run support, but man, they just kept they got they got a big a big boost from Jake <clears throat> Cave, who had an incredible spring training. I think he needs to, while he's a fourth outfielder there, he's gonna be in a lot of games. And I think he needs to get his rhythm in there. And I think, you know, Topper's the kind of manager that gets him out there. But the big story besides getting to Alcantara is Strom. I mean, I didn't know this guy was going to be a starter for him, and they came in and gave him a two-year deal. And I think he's filling in for Ranger until Ranger comes back, but he has done nothing but – he's been their best pitcher, best starting pitcher so far. And he did it again last night, and he's going to have a tough time. Not, not saying they're going to move Ranger to the pen, but if anybody needs a breather, if he keeps doing this – He's he's a huge valuable piece that I didn't see I didn't see him starting when they started him the other day I was like oh that's weird I didn't know they needed an opener and he blanked the they didn't blank him he gave up one run to the Yankees but then he went he went five I think shut yep yesterday. five scoreless innings yeah he hasn't allowed an earned run in ten innings this you season. called it yesterday though you yeah, called it yesterday I called the reverse you said Strom was sneaky good. And you took Alcantara in the Marlins. Yeah, I said he's sneaky good, but he's not going to go deep, which is but, fine. Five innings But you said fine. he was good, and most people out there outside of a hardcore baseball fan has no idea who Strom is. No, because he's bounced around. He's He's been in a bullpen for the last few years. Funky, he's done a nice lefty, job. It's tough to pick up. Angle, he know? might be – He. I don't know. Maybe this is a not a third-time through guy, or they're just trying to develop him now as a starter more. But, yeah, no, he's he's been in the league but for you a called while. It, so you called it against your luck. Correct. And yeah, and I, Which we can get strange. into it later because also my second pick was was Dodgers run line and that covered and I'm kicking myself late at night. Whatever, <laughs> you can't win them all. You got to come back down to earth. Just for anyone that wasn't aware, I was seven and zero entering last night. Okay? Oh, we were aware. Show. you let us okay. know. I want to make sure the fans know. Everybody fans, knew. You know, I, I don't talk about myself much on this show. I didn't play, so this is all about these guys. But if there's one thing that I like to cover, it's betting, and I'd like you to take a ride with me this year. And so we're seven and one. If that's okay with you, if you're good with winning seven out of eight, if that's a hot streak in your mind, if Cubs winning four out of five is a hot streak, I think seven out of eight is pretty successful. So hop on board. Let's clap. Let's clap it up for Scott. That was a great run. Let's, Scott, that was a- I know why your biceps are Thank so big you. now. Because you're so busy patting yourself on the back. <laughs> and all and the I'm time. a switch hitter, though, so I do both. <laughs> Todd, right. Todd you, missed it. you missed it yesterday. There was everything but like a trumpet before Scott – introduced his his call he was like we did ours kip did his for the first time we were like oh great job kip and scott was like and now are you ready for my pick oh my god (laughs) with a dramatic pause a hair flip (laughs) and he goes i'm gonna take the marlins because of sandy alcantara (laughs) And then he left. That was it. Yeah, I love yeah. he rode his horse. But then, he, but then he said, I'm worried about this because of yeah. Strom and yada, yada, yeah. yada. Yeah, no, I didn't feel great. I didn't love the selections last night. I didn't. So, I, and I, I was won. between that and, and the Dodgers run line. I won. It was easy won. yesterday. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a different <laughs> I'm setting. on a hot streak. I'm 1-0. You, you were on I'm a hot squirrel. streak. Yep. I got a, exactly. I got a couple other things I want to cover before we get to Ken. I'm sure he's getting checked in pretty soon here because he's supposed to be on in a few minutes. The Tampa Bay Rays are undefeated still, okay? I can't do what they do, but they are 10-0. and 0. Now, I think that I had a rougher schedule, a rougher slate than what they've had. Sure, okay. And I did say they'll probably lose tonight. No, they beat Boston, so good for them. Their pitching's ridiculous. And they pick up another dub. 10-0, and 0, baby. And then you're getting some love on Twitter with your Wander Franco call-out. I don't know. It wasn't really a call out. It was just more of a question. It was a it's like the question with the hot streak. I'm not arguing. I'm just asking so I know for future reference. To me, Wander Franco is here, and then you have the next level of star, which is a uh, Freddie Freeman, Mookie Betts, Bryce Harper, Manny Machado, MVP. Wander Franco to me is not there. So he's a star, but he's not a transcending star in the sport yet. He's also young as hell, and he's probably going to get there, and if he keeps playing the way he's playing. So, yeah, there was a Twitter poll yesterday. I wanted to hear Frazier's account on this. Here, I'm going to read it so the podcast audience can hear this. 
AJ Pruszynski and Trisha Whitaker got into a heated debate on foul territory over the Rays. Wander Franco, is he a star? So is he? And this was posted by Drew Boggs, big White Sox fan. And the answers are yes, not yet, but he's close, or no. And by far, the winner has been yes at 79%. The people have spoken. I voted. I voted not yet, but he's close. And much like when the people voted that I beat Frazier in the first pitch contest, I have to go with the people. So apparently he's a star. That's two, Fraz. <clears throat> That's not two. That's the, the two polls. So so he's going to change his mind like, like I did picking who's going to win this and that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm a man of the people. <laughs> yeah, we know you're not the man of the people. Um, anyway, I, I, don't, I don't think he's a superstar. I don't think he's a star. I, I think he's very good. Um, I'd like to see him do it over, you know, a couple year span and then we can start talking, you know, Mike Trout was good when he came up. Was he a superstar? The, you know, first couple of years he was good, but then all of a sudden year after year after year, it's like, all right, this is the guy. And in my humble opinion, I, I, I don't, I don't think he's there yet. I think he's a good, I'd like that. If I was playing, I'd love to have him right by my side, but in my opinion, he's close. He's very close, but let's who's, just see it over, over a span of time. Who's closer to being a star, him or Adley Rutschman? Adley. Rutschman for me. Oh, man, that's Adley. a good That's a good question. I think Adley's a star already, and, and Ken's ready for us, so I want to bring him in on this, and we can start bring, with him too. Bring Why Ken not? in first. I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to piggyback Ken on this one. Wander's 22 <laughs> years old, by the way. You, you want to know, Todd, what? His thoughts on this? Yeah, I would love to know Ken's thoughts okay. because I respect those thoughts. Let's go. Okay. Ken, great to talk to you. And uh, just for everyone to know, Fair Territory is up, uh, episode two. Um, is on podcast platforms and on YouTube. So give that a good listen. One thing not included there is this great debate going on right now, the definition of the word star. I use it a little more loosely, but these guys are kicking around. Is Wanda Franco a star right now? Is Adley Rutschman a star? What do you think? It's not really a debate in my mind, and I'm with Todd and AJ on this. You have to be a guy for a few years, an established player, someone who puts up numbers, over a little bit of a course of time before you are a superstar in this game. Now, Wanda Franco absolutely has the potential to be that. Adley Rushman has the potential to be that. I'm a little reluctant to declare them as that just yet. We saw Wanda last year, injury-plagued campaign, appeared in only half the Rays games. Adley Rushman obviously has not even played a full season yet. So do I expect both these guys will be superstars? Absolutely. Are they superstars right now at the level that AJ was talking about with Trout and Harper and that crowd, Mookie? No, it's not even close. Thank you, Ken. Thank uh, you. <laughs> so Wander Franco got the deal from the Rays. Are the Orioles going to sign Adley Rushman? Like, if I'm an Oriole person, I'm saying here's $200 million. Here's a, whatever it takes for 10 years. Because he's a star. Because, well, he might not be a star, a superstar, but he's the face of the Orioles. Yeah. So lock him up for 10 years, 200, whatever the going rate is. Like the Rays, I give the Rays credit. They don't spend money, but they locked up Franco. Great question, AJ. And in my opinion, they should be aggressive on that front, not just with Rushman, but with some others too, maybe Gunnar Henderson, who is even less established. But the Orioles' spending is a question for me right now. And we thought in the offseason they'd spend a little more, and they didn't. They were very modest in what they did. Now, their rationale was, we're going to be better in 24 than 23, better in 25 than in 24, so we are going to just wait before we get heavy into the free agent market. I sort of buy that, but with players like Rushman in particular, that's an exception, and that's a guy you want to lock up long term. Now, obviously... Rushman would have to play along and be willing to sign that kind of deal, and certainly it would take a lot of money to do so. But I'm not sure where they are from an ownership perspective. They talk a big game, but they have not resolved the mass in dispute with the Nationals over their rights fees. They are not the financial juggernaut that they were in the 90s when Camden Yards was selling out every night. So, again, I'm not quite sure they're in a position in their minds they should be in position, but I don't know if they're feeling this way, that they want to spend that kind of money. There's some uncertainty with the way they're being run right now, at least for me. Hey, Ken, you brought up Usain Bolt in one of your articles just uh, a little bit ago. Um, now, I want you to explain to me, and you know what I learned when I came up, a technique of stealing bases. So now everybody talks about the stolen bases, guys are getting more bases. 
but the Yankees come up with this new technique, a kind of like a jump, not a high jump, a little hop, side hop and go. Like when I got taught Eric Davis and Joe Morgan, two of the best ever teach me how to steal base. I had 20 in one year. I don't know how, you know, probably because of them, <laughs> but I had, I had a running lead and I know Anthony Rizzo was a guy that I talked to a lot about it. Now they got this hop lead. Can you explain a little further what they're doing? And I think they're all really excited about this. And we've seen some with Aaron Judge and with uh, Volpe as well. Todd, it's not a new thing. And that's the first thing I should emphasize. Okay. I wrote a long article about this today in The Athletic. And it's something that actually started at the Kansas City Royals Baseball Academy probably in the late 60s. And Mike Roberts, Brian's father, was a Royals minor leaguer in the early 70s. And that's where he learned it. And what the Yankees call it, and that's a team that is using it to a great extent and running wild in the minors, they call it a momentum lead. So it's kind of a walking lead, but it's more than that. And there is a hop jump element. There's video accompanying the article in which you can really see it better. And what that does is it kind of gets a runner going, almost like an infielder in his pre-pitch movement. You're building momentum for the pitch. Tennis player returning a serve when they're jumping up and down a little bit, kind of getting the body going. That's the idea. Now, I had a scout tell me this morning after this article came out, we can shut that down. Catcher drops his glove. No pitcher sees it, throws over, we're fine. Okay, but last two years, the Yankees have led the minors in stolen bases. Judge had his career high last year. Volpe certainly is excellent at this move. Brian Roberts did it with the Orioles for years. There were others who did a variation of it as well. So we'll see. We'll see where it goes. But in an age now with the new rules that encourage base stealing, this kind of technique, it seems, can be something that teams use to their benefit. Let me ask you this to that point. So a guy picks over, all right, gets one. Now we know he only has one more time he can pick over to, to first base. Have you seen, I don't know if you know the total numbers, but have you seen a drop off of guys picking off there, there's got to be some crazy stat. Like, if you, there can't be many that throw it for a second time. So why not basically just get that hop lead and just go after he picks over the first time? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm not sure what the numbers are, Todd. And I don't know if pickoffs were ever tracked before, right? Okay. I don't think that's something even that the most advanced statistical services have been looking at. I can't say that for sure because they seem to look at everything. But – I don't know where pickoffs are this year either, and it's tough to do a comparison if we don't know the numbers before, right? But at the same time, the idea of timing the pitcher, right? That's something base stealers do. Well, it becomes more problematic for the defensive side of it when the pitch clock is in effect and the base runner can effectively time the pitcher as well as his move. So I'm kind of interested to hear what AJ and Eric think about this as former catchers because... It is a very challenging time, it seems to me, for both the pitcher and catcher with the rules in effect as we know them today. Yeah, Ken, we, I'm all for it. Right? Yeah. I'm all for it. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. No, you're good. We need, we need to stop talking about stolen bases because I, I sleep well at night that I'm not, you know, I'm not playing anymore. We don't need any more stolen bases. We need pitchers to figure it out. Pitchers for so long have just been – as I've said it so many times, smelling salts and velo slap and throw the ball as hard as you can through the wall. And now all of a sudden they're becoming an integral part of a game. You know, they're becoming in essence, a quarterback. How do I run that clock? How do I use my disengagements? You know, I saw Taiwan Walker the other day, pick over and get a balk on the third time because he didn't get the guy. So it, it's something that can be used, but how about a guy like Scherzer? Like you wrote about, you wrote about the Mets and and their what they're pushing through. Everyone sees him as a guy that's like, oh, I want to take control. Is he able to control the game? Like in what what you've what you've uh, you know talked to him about or, or wrote about the other day? It was just you know, can he make the adjustments to everything that's going on, or are we in trouble in in Queens? He's Max Scherzer. And Eric, I expect that he's going to figure it out because he's a great athlete with a great mind for pitching and one of the great performers of our age. He is a superstar. So he definitely is having an adjustment with the clock. And we asked him about that last night post game. And he said the issue for him is with a runner on base and at the start of an at bat because he feels that's a time in the past 
where the natural rhythm of the game would slow down and he'd take a breath and assess where he is, etc. And now he can't do that. The clock is right there. It gets going right away. The whole thing is an adjustment and it's an especially, especially an adjustment for pitchers who have not been in the minors in this era, older guys like Scherzer. And it's something he's going to have to deal with. Now he's also in a spot right now where he's not seemingly at his best. He was better last night, five scoreless, but it took 97 pitches to get through it. Ran deep counts all night. It's the Padres. It's a good lineup, but it's also a team that got in at 3 a.m. the night before. So I would expect that would mitigate a little bit of their edge. It's interesting to see how this is all playing out for all players on both sides of the ball. And with Scherzer, we'll just have to see. With Verlander, we'll have to see. He's never done this either once he returns. So I don't know where it's going. And one of the fascinating parts of this season for Scherzer, for every player, is that adjustment and how it will take place and whether it will be successful or not. Hey, we talk about <clears throat> pitchers making the adjustment like Eric and you talked about. I find it fascinating to hear that his arm angle was three inches lower than what it's been. Um, first off, how, how does someone even find that out? And second off, you know, I, I, in my opinion, I don't feel like that would make that big of a deal. But I guess there's a that might be the single most adjustment he has to make. Or is it pitch selection? Because to me, I feel like he just got rocked on some of his better pitches. The pitters just hit him well. But we're talking about, we talk about the bases, four and a half inches. Now his arm angle's here, or where am I at? Here, instead of here. Like, I don't know. Does that make a big difference? What do you think? I, I don't know. It, it's confusing to me. Well, first of all, someone told me at the park last night that that was happening. And then there is data to support that kind of thing. When you hear it, you can check it. And we have a guy on our staff, Eno Saris, who is one of the best analytics-based writers in the sport, maybe the best. In my opinion, he is the best. And he came up with this graph that we included in the story. And yes, it's down. Now, what does that mean? That's hard to say. Sometimes it means there's a physical issue. Sometimes it means his arm just dropped a little bit this year. And that's the way it is. It's part of the aging process. Maybe it's nothing at all. Three inches, though, can be significant. And what happens when your arm drops, <laughs> Eric, you can speak to this AJ too. Your stuff flattens out. And that's what we're talking about here. Ken, is three inches more significant or four and a half? I'm oh, just asking. Mike, here we go. Here we go. Here AJ, we go. let's talk baseball, all right? You can we are talking baseball. Later. Three we're inches for Scherzer, four and a half for no, Todd. I'm just trying to figure no. out what's more significant. Let me ask just because <laughs> we're on um, somewhat of an injury front, okay? Because there's been a lot of news over the past 24 hours. So if you want to take any of these – Correa seems hurt. I know you wrote about that a little bit in, in the daily newsletter in the windup um, on the athletic Tim Anderson sounds like two to four weeks with a knee injury that he suffered yesterday. And then I just saw in the past 10 minutes, Mark Bowman put out there that Ian Anderson is likely to go uh, undergo Tommy John surgery this week. So here we are the usual in baseball, a lot of bad injuries for pretty notable names. I know Anderson wasn't good the past year or so, and mostly was in the minors, but still, I mean, I hope remember in the world yeah. series a couple of years ago. Nasty. Yeah, no doubt. And I talked about this on fair territory yesterday. I kind of went on a rant that all this concern clubs have over the WBC and fans have, uh, once the season starts, things seem to go awry, even with players under their protection, of the clubs, under the clubs watch, just the nature of the game in many ways. And the one that sticks out to me of the ones you mentioned is Tim Anderson and the White Sox in general. They've got Aloy on the injured list, Joe Kelly on the injured list, Moncada is dealing with something. And here we go again. Injuries crushed this team last season. They're already down in the bullpen without Hendricks and Crochet. They feel they're going to have a great bullpen once those guys come back. So... Here's the old question. If they're healthy, yes, they're a really good team. But if they're not healthy, they're not. And that's what they're facing. Ian Anderson has gone backwards. Maybe now we know why. Maybe the physical part of that and the elbow was part of the reason he regressed. And Correa, the back has been the issue over the years, not the ankle that came up during the winter when he was, of course, dealing with the Mets and the Giants and not getting signed or not getting deals completed. So that one to me is less of a concern because he takes care of himself really well and he seems to know how to take care of that particular issue. He's done things this to, over the past couple of years really to address that. But the White Sox, it seems to be more of a team-wide thing and that is concerning. 
Ken, you mentioned Correa. Correa hurt his back trying to avoid a collision at the plate. And then you mentioned the White Sox. The White Sox got into a fisticuff semi because O'Neill Cruz was trying to avoid kind of a collision at the plate, and then he ended up breaking his ankle. Can, can we please bring back collisions at the plate? <laughs> <laughs> or can we teach guys to slide better? One or the other. Or, or that. Run the bases better. All these things come into it. And, hey, I know you guys probably to a man feel this way. The fundamental aspect of the game, some of the basic things players need to do to succeed that aren't measured by miles per hour or launch angle, all these things, they've been lost over the years as the emphasis has been on power, power on both sides of the ball. And frankly, the instruction needs to come back. It's probably always been there. It's just not as emphasized as it once was. And we see that come out really in all phases of the game every night. So, Ken, but the thing is, is now the, the, the coaches at the big league level, you ask them. They have to develop at the major league level because guys right. are rushed. So they don't get the time in the minor leagues, one, to fail, learn the fundamentals, learn basic stuff, because at the big league level, you're expected to perform. And the coaches are saying, oh, no, you have to learn how to slide. You have to learn how to tell a guy to get down. You have to do this. You have to do all these things because guys are rushed. That's part of it too, AJ. But I really believe one benefit of the new rules as we go back to an older school style of play will be that some of these details, some of the nuances of the game come back. And if that happens, that's a really good development because you guys know this. One of the beautiful parts of baseball are all those nuances, all the little things you can do to help your team win a game. It's not all about hitting the ball. 900 miles, it's not all about throwing the ball 100 miles an hour. There is a lot to this game that goes deeper, goes underneath those particular skills. And they've been lost over the years, those skills. And now perhaps they come back because you see how teams that are fundamentally sound, and there are many of them, can do things to win games along these lines. It's pretty obvious. It stands out, but it just doesn't happen all that often. Who do you think is going to be taking advantage of these, the new rules, the base stealing? You know, you look to a team like Arizona or you look to a team like the Rays, who had the least amount of stolen bases of any team. Like, who's going to be taking advantage of these? And is it something that organizations are going to say, well, you know, this isn't sustainable for the whole season because analytically they don't have numbers on it. So, who, who, who in, your, in your opinion, is going to be taking advantage of this? Eric, an executive made the point to me a couple of weeks ago saying, hey, you guys can talk all you want in the media about stolen bases and how they're coming back and how cool that is. But the best way to win games is still to get on base and hit the ball out of the ballpark. That's not going to change. But if you have a team like Arizona that is young and athletic and that has guys that can run, the stolen base absolutely becomes more of a weapon. Baltimore has shown that too. The Diamondbacks lead the majors in steals, lead the majors, I believe, in percentage as well, success rate. And this is a team that obviously can play this game a little bit differently under these rules. What I do think we'll see with the rules are certain teams that go about it the old-fashioned way, right? On base, hit the ball out of the park. It's certainly successful. We know that. But there are teams that will also incorporate more of the speed elements. Maybe some teams like the Diamondbacks that will almost lean that way. To me, that makes the game much more fun to watch. We have different styles of play now. We have more than one way to win a game. Baseball had become somewhat boring because everyone was doing the same thing. Three true outcomes, home run or walk, that's what we want. No. There are other ways to go about it, and now the rules enhance that kind of thing. I want to go back to um, Steve Cohen and the Mets. So you, you've talked about and you wrote about how the Mets are trying to uh, basically do what the Dodgers did, you know, spend money early and then, you know, build up the farm system. Well, right now the farm system's ranked 15th, as you said. Um, so what's the next move for Steve trying to do that? They're going to continue with the farm system, and that's something even this offseason – as much money as they spent, they were protective of their draft picks and they were protective of their young players with regard to trades. They didn't do anything along those lines. What they did was spend on players who 
could be had without losing a draft pick. So you can see what their strategy is and how they're going about it. It's difficult to do what the Dodgers did. And that's the point of what I wrote today. I'm not saying, oh, the Mets are a failure because they're not doing what the Dodgers did. No. What I'm saying is, with regard to the starting rotation, starting pitching, the Dodgers, when the Guggenheim baseball management took over the team in 2012, first full season was 2013. They had Kershaw, 25 years old. They had just signed Greinke, who was 29. Kershaw is a lock Hall of Famer. Greinke, in my mind, is a Hall of Famer as well. You're getting two guys in the primes of their career. Now, the Mets, in third year of Steve Cohen's ownership, they have two future Hall of Famers in the rotation, but they're no longer in their primes. Max Scherzer's 38. Justin Verlander is 40. With that kind of age comes different challenges. Injury risk definitely increases. Durability becomes more of a question. So that is why what the Dodgers did, it is absolutely the right model, and they did it extremely well. They also operated at a time in the game when they could take on the Adrian Gonzalez, Josh Beckett contracts almost for nothing, if you remember that big trade. It is different now. You can't get players that way. But the Mets do have the money to get players, and they're doing that. All I'm saying is that Steve Cohen did not inherit that bounty that the Guggenheim group did in Los Angeles. Even DeGrom was older and injured when they got him. He wasn't totally injured, but he didn't pitch that much in Cohen's first two years. It's a challenge. It's difficult to pull off. And while the Mets are valiantly trying, we'll see how it works out for them with Scherzer and Verlander. Tough for me to bet against those guys. They've accomplished so much. They've been outliers throughout their careers. And we saw Randy Johnson win a World Series at age 37. We saw Schilling at ages 34, 37, and 40 win World Series. I'm not saying this is impossible. All I'm saying is the degree of difficulty is greater. Ken, I don't know if you could hear us earlier. We were discussing the Cubs and Nico Horner having the walk-off hit yesterday, and you brought up the Diamondbacks and their speed. Who has a better roster right now, the Diamondbacks or the Cubs? Oh, good question. I would say... I trust the Cubs starting pitching more. I like the Diamondbacks bullpen and where it's going. Lineup-wise, off the top of my head, AJ, that's a tough one because the Diamondbacks do have some young players. We don't really know who they are yet. Carroll and McCarthy and Alec Thomas. The Cubs have Bellinger and Trey Mancini and Swanson, more established guys who obviously have something to prove in certain cases. So... I don't know. What do you think on that one? What's your opinion? I, 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 well, I, Todd said that the Cubs are closer to making the playoffs, and I kind of disagreed with him. But I, I think that I, I'm surprised you said that about the Cubs starting pitching because Gallen, Merrill Kelly, Bumgarner, those guys have done it for. Bumgarner's on the downside. And okay. they've got two talented kids, Dre Jameson and Ryan Nelson, who are in the rotation now because Davies got injured. I like those guys. They've done really well, but they're kids. So the Cubs have a little bit more of one to five stability, in my opinion. Kyle Hendricks will come back. Bumgarner is not Bumgarner. And maybe he gets to the point where he's a competent back of the rotation starter. But besides Gallon and Kelly, it's at least questionable. It might be very good. I don't know. But it's not, in my view, quite as stable as what the Cubs have. Okay, fair. (laughs) Hey, Ken, I'm going to leave you with this because I know you're a busy man. Fun question of the day for me to you is, and it's real simple. You just give me give me the name that you think, and then you don't have to even explain. All right, who who wins in who wins in a fight, Gabe Kapler or Phil Nevin? <laughs> <laughs> we have Phil that's on a, later. We Ken. have Phil later. We got so Phil that's coming on why. Later. And I that's think a great question. Fans would think Kapler based hey, on. Hey, don't let him, let him pick it. Let I'm him giving him it. some. Co- he wasn't on with us earlier. I'm who cares? Let him. He he knows who they are. All right, so I'm going to analyze this in a certain way. <laughs> I just need a name, that's all. Hold on, I'm going to give you more than that. Gabe, certainly, I mean, that guy is a pillar of strength physically. Phil is too. I just feel, and I hope Phil wouldn't get offended by this, but I feel he'd get angrier and we yes! just stop. So I go with Phil. See? Phil would fight dirty, dude. Phil would fight <laughs> he, dirty. He never said dirty. He said Yeah, angrier. he'd get angrier, and angry means to dirty. No. Yep. <laughs> You're picking them because that's your best friend. 
No, that's not my best friend. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, I mean, you call them all different sorts of names in the book. Wait till we talk to him. I'm going to let we him We got know. him. We got him soon. So let's Ken, let Ken jump. Thank I, you. I know some had, had fan questions. We'll get to those next week. Um, wait, hold on. Before he goes, Ken, finish. wait, what? Ken put out a Twitter question thing the other day. And, and, uh, something about ask me a question. Yeah, for fan I asked him a question, <laughs> and he didn't respond. <laughs> all right. Now, AJ, I'll be happy to Did give you see my question? Did I you saw see my question? question and and I you did didn't not answer. Respond. What All was right, the here's the thing. AJ, when he was a player, occasionally, maybe more than occasionally, would help me. He'd guide me in certain directions. And then he would tell me, you owe me a dinner for that. At last count, the total number of dinners I owe him is up to eight, and it actually might be higher. I have yet to repay them because, of course, AJ is a man. He's a bon vivant. He's a man about town. I can never find the guy. Let's face it. But one day I'm going to have to take him out for a nice dinner and probably multiple nice dinners. That's fair. Okay. That's fair. I didn't know that. Well, there. You got your answer yeah. right here on Foul that's Territory. Right. That's right. He didn't cover it on Fair Territory because that's his damn show, and he says that on his show. But on Foul Territory, he gets to take shit from you. So, Ken, thank you. We'll see you later in the week. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Awesome. That was good, uh, and I didn't have time and for everyone in the YouTube chat right now. Sorry, we uh, ran out of time because Ross Stripling is going to join us in the next few minutes, but um, we'll get to your questions next week, So, or later this week, actually, Ken's on. So he's on twice a week if you're new to the program here. Um, Stripling and Phil Nevin, that was a good breakdown there. I like Todd Father going, you can just give me a name. Ken's not just going to give you a name. He's going to give you analysis. He's got to break it down and back it up because he's also got to face both of these guys at some point this year, and you know it's going to get around to cap. Cap yeah. is going to at some point go, oh, hey, Ken, um, sorry, oh. just just finished doing doing uh, 300 dips with uh, 245s <laughs> dangling off my body. Um, but I heard you don't think I can take Phil Nevin. Hey, listen, you guys still haven't asked me who I thought. I mean, you guys already picked your answer, so I'm just going to sit here and be quiet. No, I absolutely No, now we want to know. We can't oh, shut up. Oh, we forgot oh, okay. about you. Oh, can, sure. can we get the tail of the tape from the Todd father? I'm going Gabe Kapler, no doubt about it, bro. This guy, hey. Short and quick, boom, boom. He's got some explosiveness. He's, he's got the size. To, I know Phil's bigger, but I'm going with the shorter stature, the guy that, you know, maybe he's got a little more in the tank. I don't know. I'm going with Gabe Kapler. I'm with you, Todd Father. I think Kapler, too. And yeah. here's my big thing. Stamina. Kapler, I'm assuming, is younger than Phil, right? Yeah. 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 He's younger, and he's definitely – Able to go 12 rounds if needed. I know you said Phil won't stop. Gabe won't stop either. It ain't getting okay? to 12 rounds because Phil's doing something to, to, to get that advantage somewhere along the way. I promise you. So, what? so Phil is he's the He's grabbing Tyson? him in the nuts. Is he's he doing something. Tyson? I'm telling you. He's throat chopping him. I mean, there's something happening. So this he's going to bite him. <laughs> yeah, he's going to eat something. He's listen, not, listen this when isn't you're like, fighting, there's no there's, – you do what you got to do to win. I don't, I don't care. Okay. Well, guess what? This is exactly why we have him on throughout the season. Giants pitcher, Ross Stripling, joining us right now on Foul Territory Live. Ross, great to have you back. And the, the great debate somehow organically created today <laughs> that's been covered by each of our guys, plus Ken Rosenthal, plus it'll turn into a poll that I'm sure will go viral, and we have Phil Nevin on later. Super random, but who wins in a fight, Gabe Kapler or Phil Nevin? You know, what's funny is I was in the in the room waiting to come on and I could uh, hear you guys talking about it. So I started Googling. I knew uh, Phil had some COVID-19 stuff. So I'm, I'm just like reading this article. It says uh, he got tired after 15 minutes of physical exercise since COVID-19. Gabe Kapler doesn't get tired. So it's just it's a no brainer to me. Kapler's a machine. Um, unless Nevin landed one good shot early, uh, Kapler's just outlasting him. And it's, I, don't, I don't think it's even close. He's got to do a Mike Tyson. He's got he's got to get him early, and if he doesn't, then you know Gabe's gonna be bouncing around like let's go, let's go, let's go, man. That's awesome. Hey, Ross has to say that he plays for Gabe. He's not gonna say, hey, my kid's gonna yeah. get his ass kicked. By no, Phil. he's he's an honest man. I I can read him already. He looked he's looking me straight in the eye. There's, he would tell us if he didn't think so. It's like, hey, listen, you know, I if Dusty Baker was to fight, you know, Gabe Kapler, who who do you got? Like, I hey, there's a Dusty. reason Kapler's biceps are out every day, man. He's just waiting. Just give him a chance. He's waiting. No. Doubt are there any quirks? Are there any quirks, Ross, that you've gotten out of? Because I played with Gabe 97, 98, so 25 years ago. Is there any quirks? That you, like, when I had him, he didn't eat cheese on his pizza. This is 25 years ago. You're, on the, you're in the minor yeah. leagues, and you get pizza, and you take the cheese off. And we're like, mm -hmm. what's wrong with this guy? 
Lactose right. intolerant, maybe. No, he just didn't eat no. cheese because he had to do his photo <laughs> shoots with his 12-pack. Mm. So is there any quirks in the first couple weeks in spring training you've noticed you didn't know? AJ, they're all food related, man. They're, that's, uh, I think he's constantly trying new things with his diet. And the one I believe he's done, I want to say for four years now, so I can't really say it's like a new thing, but I believe he only eats red meat. Uh, the only thing that goes in his body is red meat. Doesn't eat vegetables and eggs, sorry, and eggs. Um, now he'll put like some avocado on his red meat or, or whatever, but it's no chicken, no fish, it's red meat. And, um, you know, he can explain it much better to me, but essentially – Yes, your cholesterol gets up there, but if you're a healthy man and you don't have heart issues or underlying family stuff in your history, cholesterol is not that big of a deal, according to him and the research that he's done. So he just hammers red meat and he's like, I feel great. I'm never bloated. Uh, I don't get that hungry. And I just hammer red meat and eggs and I feel great. Um, the other thing you'll see him do maybe every now and then is like if he has a craving. Now, this is back 10 years ago when he was my minor league coordinator with the Dodgers. He would eat like a bite of an In-N-Out burger and spit it out. Because he wanted the craving or had the craving. He wanted to satisfy it, but he didn't want that actually going into his body. Yes, so, like, I told that bar. story. Yeah. I told that story to somebody the other yeah, day. Yeah. He used to take ice cream. He used to take ice cream and put it in his mouth, oh, and he would spit man. the ice no. cream out. No. He would put the no. ice cream in and spit the ice cream out, and he would say, oh, Gabe, Gabe's body likes the taste of ice cream, but Gabe's body can't handle the ice cream. <laughs> so he would eat that and spit it in a water bottle. <laughs> yes. I haven't seen it. As a giant, I haven't seen it, but I've seen it back in the day, oh, and it is a, it's a sight to see. I mean, you don't look like that at his age unless you have that kind of uh, diligence, so props to him. That's, I don't, that's I, amazing. I don't even know what to say. Like, I, I'm not <laughs> sure, like. Stumped you guys. <laughs> I had. Too. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, does this, like, does this, is, is, it, is that a distraction? Like, is that a distraction <laughs> if your managers so much look at me? No. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to mute myself. I lost my voice. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Talking about that. Um, no, not at all, man. It's not. He doesn't do it to be a distraction. <clears throat> he doesn't do any of that stuff in anybody's face. It's not like he's walking around with a plate of red meat saying, look at me, look at me. Um, it's just who he is. And, you know, he's he's a competitor on the dinner table as much as he is on the baseball field. You know, it's just like the way that he is, is uh, it's ingrained in him. So no, we don't feel that way at all, man. I mean, yeah, we, we know that when he goes out to pull a pitcher, you're going to hear some hoots and hollers from some girls in the, in the front rows that love the way he looks. And, and he definitely loves that too. You can tell, you know, he changes his shoes every day. He's on Instagram and, and, you know, <laughs> biceps are out in the sun and in the outfield. It's, it, you know, it, it's, it's, he's, he's unique. There's no other manager like him. And, um, you know, I think he's good for baseball, man. He, he, he brings up our uh, sex appeal for sure. We need it. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a fan club. I'll actually counter Crafty's oh. question. Is he a motivation for some players that maybe don't hit the gym or work out as hard? I'll, I'll relate it to myself in a different way. Just that as a broadcaster, I know many other broadcasters that can't catch a ball that can't go in a weight room, that can't do anything. It's not why I do it, but I will say, like, especially previous people I've worked with, these guys just make fun of me, but previous people I've worked with actually respect that, like, you know, if we hit the gym together or something, yeah, I can't hit a baseball, but like most other things, I can probably keep up with them. So if you walk in every day and you see Cap already got two hours in the gym and he's, he's in better shape or as, as good a shape as anyone on the ball club, can't hurt, right? You know what he is? is a really good soundboard for guys that um, want to work out hard. I mean, you know, the, of the three of you guys that played, um, it's hard to work out three, four days a week in a 162-game season. There's, there's guys that don't work out in the season because if you're taking ground balls and hitting BP and playing every day, it just wears your body down. Kapler is a guy that has a motor that could work out the way that we know he works out and could play. Uh, at a successful level in the big league. So I think that there's a lot of guys, myself included, I'm not a position player, but I'll pick his brain about what his cardio stuff is, what his lifting schedule is, because, um, you know, I touched on it earlier. You don't look like that at his age if you don't know what you're doing. And the other part of it is there's a rhyme or reason to why he does it. It's not like he's just in there getting a pump to look good. He 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 wants to remain functional and uh, mobile and all the stuff that you need to be a baseball player. Obviously, he's not anymore, but that's still part of, why he does what he does. And I think guys just like hearing his take on certain things because 
there are guys that want to work out and understand that it, it can actually be a detriment to your game because of the energy it can pull away from you when you're trying to get a big hit at 9 p.m. and you lift it at 3 p.m. really hard and you emptied the tank in that lift. Um, you know, that kind of stuff matters over the course of 185 days. So I, I just think that Kapler is a good soundboard for guys that are, want to lift and want to have a good regiment and want another opinion than just our strength coaches who are great in their own right. But to hear it from a player oftentimes is different. Hey, I want to talk about Michael Conforto a little bit. I know we're having some fun with some good questions, but play one with the Mets, just a happy go lucky dude. Cool as the other side of the pillow, happy for him right now, what he's doing, especially had to take the whole year off with the injury. And now out there with you guys in, um, in San Francisco, man, talk to me about him. I know there's a video of party in the clubhouse, man. He looks <laughs> like he's having such a blast. Um, how, how is how's he doing out there? And um, how, how's he as a teammate? Cause I know he's such a good dude. Yes. I mean, spot on. Um, we're lucky to have him. And you can tell from the start of spring training, he was just pumped to be around guys again, to be in a locker room again, to, um, you know, be on a team and, and be playing baseball and be healthy. Uh, he looks great. And, you know, he hit a homer off a lefty the other day in the eighth inning to take the lead in a game that we really needed. We we're on the verge of getting swept by the Royals at home and he hits a go at homer. And uh, that's the that's the video you see is after that going to the locker room, we're just all there waiting to greet him and, and uh, have a party in the locker room because of how how big of a hit that was. I mean, he's he's a game changing player. I feel like people can forget about him. You take a year away from this game. People can mm -hmm. forget how good you are and forget that um, how powerful of a bat he is, how good of an outfielder he is and, and how he can be a difference maker for a team like the Giants and how badly we need him. You know, we we there's a lot of star power in this division talking Padres and Dodgers. We're the Giants. We're just kind of solid across the board, but we're going to really rely on Conforto to get big hits for us against righties and lefties all year. And um, so far, he's off to a great start. And as a teammate, couldn't be better. Like you said, cool is the other side of the pillow. Um, so far, you know, I've known him for two months. I've never seen him had a bad day. Uh, seems like he's the same guy every day, which is all you can ask for. So, um, you know, definitely pumped. He's on my team, no doubt. Ross, Conforto went deep off Michael Kopech the other day in Chicago, one of the, the bunch of homers y'all hit, 13 in three games. Yeah. Now, there was a video where he was tipping his pitches with his glove. You guys obviously have a guy that looks for that on other teams. Do, they, do you guys have a guy that looks for it on your team to show you guys and says, hey, Ross, you're doing something with your glove or your windup or, or your hands or whatever? Do you guys have that with the Giants also? Yeah, of course. Uh, and I think that's more important than trying to find anybody on the other team that's doing something. Yeah, you might be able to pick up something and that's a huge advantage for our hitters. But if if a pitcher on your team, specifically the Giants, let's say, has a tip and we don't have anyone that's readily available to address that, that's looking for that kind of stuff. That's that's a huge disadvantage for a Major League Baseball team. If any team doesn't have someone looking for that, I'd be shocked because as a man that's tipped in a variety of different ways, I used to tip my curveball like this. I'd bite mm -hmm. as I'm like coming yeah. down the slope. I'm but and, it, and it's one of those things that you don't even know you're doing and then you see yourself doing it, it's clear as day and and once a hitter sees that man you guys can hone in on like that um like nobody else so if we we have two really i would say two guys one of them is one of our coaches and one of them is a guy that's you know back in a dungeon watching video catching on this stuff but um yeah it's it's it would be detrimental to a team if, if they didn't have someone like that trying to catch tips because it's, it's that big of a deal and that big of an advantage so, so you're making you're making me mad now because my white socks you know you guys hit all those homers and you guys didn't tell us until after you left town so <laughs> at least I we, guess told you. we could have we <laughs> yeah, yeah. Others. yeah we well been... some, someone else told us yeah if you hit 13 homers in three games you definitely told them thanks a lot <laughs> Do you, do you find it like those tips when they tell you those things and you've played on some teams that I know have people that are looking for those tips. Are you conscious of it? Are you like, not, not conscious of it. Like, Ooh, I got to stop that. Like conscious of it. Like, like that, that guy just got a hit. Did I just, did I just bite my lip? How does that, how does that run through your head? Yeah, it's, um, it varies for sure. I, like I said, I've tipped in a million different ways. Uh, I could stand up and go through my motion and show you the 47 ways I've tipped over the years. Um, it is a constant battle for me. The other day I threw um, Salvi a pretty good change up down and he hits a home, like a tying home run late in the game. And that, one of the first things I thought was like, man, did he know that was coming? Because it was the catcher went to block it and Salvi hits a home run. I know he's one of the strongest guys in the game, but as a guy that's tipped, that thought went through my head and went through my dad's head when I'm talking to him after the game. He's like, man, you think you're tipping? I'm like, no, sometimes you just tip your cap to the hitter. I don't think that I am. But yeah, I, I, as someone, like I keep saying that is tipped, I want to know. I, I want the coach to come to me and be like, Strip, we got this on you. It might be huge. It might be the tiniest little thing, but tell me about it. 
there are some guys that are pretty stubborn about it and don't really want to know because of kind of what you're asking, Kratzy, where it can it can kind of almost do more harm than good. And, and yeah, it needs to be addressed and you need to fix it, but sometimes it can lead to even worse things mentally or, or, or tips another way or where you're, you know, I'm trying to get player X, Y, Z out and I'm thinking about what I'm doing tipping instead of being a competitor out there on the mound when, I, when the lights are on, um, you know, so it, it can lead to some bad things, but I've always been open to it saying, you, you got to tell me cause I got to address it. I'm not a guy that throws 98. If you know, my changeup's coming, uh, it's going to be a rough day for me. So I, I need to know. Hey, does, does Max Muncy know that Mad Bum is not on the Giants anymore? I mean, Jesus, the guy is he's, he's hitting <laughs> balls every which way. The guy is on fire right now. Jesus. Yeah, you know, I saw the stats coming in. I, I saw the, you know, some power in there, but not necessarily good average. But that guy just loves hitting at Oracle Field. He oh. has uh, since the start. Uh, he told Mad, Mad Bum to go get the ball out of the ocean <laughs> after homering off of him. Uh, classic Max Muncy fashion. And then yesterday goes two oppo homers for a grand slam and a three run homer and basically beats us himself. So uh, I'm sure when I get there today, we'll have a maybe a new plan against him about something we're going to do to try and keep him in the ballpark. But, you know, the, the Dodgers, that lineup is really deep. And when Muncy is, is putting together quality at bats like he can and hitting the ball out of the field and driving the ball like he can, it's an even deeper lineup. So, yeah, it's uh, it, it, we, we got to figure that one out and fast. Stick them. Speaking stick of Muncie him. Code. Stick him. <laughs> stick him, Eric. Tell him to stick him. No, just throw Muncie a curveball. You know what he you know what his numbers are on curveballs. Come on, you know that. That's your old teammate. <laughs> Some guys don't have curveballs, so what do you do? Figure one out. Just okay. <laughs> loop, loop something in there. Two, throw, flip it in there. Speaking of Muncie Cove, would you get on one of those things? That those dudes, not the kayaks. I'm not even talking about the kayaks or the yachts. Everybody wants to get on one of those. And as a financial guy, you can afford the yacht. Would you get on one of those things that the dude was that's connected to the sea dude with the water coming out and spinning around? <laughs> oh man. Maybe once, just like I'll try everything once. Right. But then after that, probably not for me. I tell you what, man. So I'm living out in the East Bay and it's beautiful. It's like 70 and sunny here today. And then the whole weather thing is true. It's like a vortex down there in San Fran. I'll get down there. And yesterday at first pitch, it was like 50 and raining, but it's not raining. It's just like the air is just like stuck. And it's just like <laughs> wet air just stuck over the baseball field. So I imagine those dudes out there in uh, Muncie Cove, as you call it, I think I got to call it McCovey Cove, are, are freezing because in the dugout, I'm cold. So I imagine out there, it's an even another like 10, 15 degrees colder. Here's the thing, because I'm a total hot weather snob, like I'll get 80s, 90s all day. I'm in Orlando most of the time nowadays, so I'm in the perfect spot for it. But serious question, it's not like it can be easily done. Do you think that the weather affects fans more nowadays than it used to? I feel like fans might be a little more like, eh, I got a good setup at home. I'm going to skip going out if it's 40, 50 degrees. Because you've always heard it for years and the old candlestick, people complaining it was like winter out there in September. You know, it barely ever gets super hot there and super, at least for me, baseball comfortable. So yeah, sure. Call me a little soft on that. But do you think that San Francisco should consider a retractable roof? Uh, specifically San Francisco. No, I think it's part of the, uh, the lore of Oracle field. And, and, uh, you know, people have asked me since the start of my career, the park I love the most, and I've always said Oracle field. I, I do think it's, you know, outside of like Wrigley and Fenway, it's one of a kind. I think if you roofed it, it would lose some of its luster. Um, and it's not like freezing, it's just cold, right? It's not like uh, Lambeau field or Chicago in the winter or, or anything. It's just cold and wet. It's a wet cold. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, I've never thought about it, but sure, it's like, uh, you know, I'm like you, I'm warm weathered. If it's cold and I have a, you know, an 80 inch screen at home and, and uh, I can sit at home and watch the game like that and listen to you guys talk as opposed to freezing in the stands. Um, yeah, maybe I'm staying back. So maybe that's part of it, but um, you know, baseball's got some awesome fans. So I think people are, are going out and supporting the squads no matter what, unless we're talking freezing temps. Scott's been smoking the doobie out there in San Francisco too much, thinking they're going to put a roof in. They're not going to put a roof there. Been in that place? Why? It's amazing. You're saying because it smells like weed? That no, they're... because you've been smoking something more than weed. If you think they're going to put a roof out there, <laughs> why? They're not going to put a roof in California. <laughs> yeah, but it's not LA and it's not San Diego. It doesn't rain. I don't know. It gets cold though, and people complain about it all the time. He just said it. I'm the same way. Okay, for me, for ba uh, for football, for example. Right. My family goes to a lot of Jets games. 
And besides a few of the games, I'm like, I'm good. It's And I know it's, it's colder. It's different. It's like 35, 40 degrees. I'm like, you know what? I really like the NFL experience at home. Why is that so surprising? He basically agreed with me that yeah, it he was said it's option. cold, but he didn't, he didn't say they're going to put a dome in San Francisco. But my point is, I think it would actually help. I think fans, especially nowadays, like they, they pack that place. That if they're good, they pack Ross. They pack that place. Yes. Tell them. Yeah, I was being nice. I'm definitely closer to your reaction, AJ. It, it, Thank it you. Would, it, <laughs> Thank there's you. no no way they're putting a roof on Oracle. Dude, Field. That place is unbelievable. <laughs> I like the place. It's a, a retractable. The smell roof of the garlic fries. People out there in kayaks. You would smell it more if you had it. And the seagulls, man. I tell you what. Seagulls. It's, it's, seagulls. seagulls. Stay, stay around for like 10 minutes after last pitch, and and uh, it's like freaking bird central out there, man. It's kind of wacky to watch, actually. Are they thrown off because the game – you know, I, I the thing always when you'd watch on TV is like if the game's going late and then they start coming in because they're on a, their own clock. So now if the games are ending quicker, do they have to adjust too like all the big leaguers are adjusting? <laughs> You know what? I'll ask them. Uh, I haven't had a chance to sit down with any yet, but I'll uh, I'll get a feel for their schedule and see how they're coping with the with the with the pitch clock like we are. Ross, you said you said how much you love Oracle Park. Did this? How much? Like, I want to talk about your free agency. Like, what are the other teams that you were you were looking at, and like, what did that did that come into play? Did the fans come into play when you thought about that? You know, your decision to sign with the Giants. Yeah, of course, it all comes into play. Um, I would say the teams down the stretch were the really the Blue Jays and the Giants with the Cubs kind of in the mix. And, um, you know, I love Toronto. I really did. But San Francisco is a city that I've always loved going to, loved playing there. I already talked about Oracle Park, a division I'm really familiar with, um, a rivalry that I'm really familiar with, knowing how important it is from a Dodger fan base and team. Now get to experience it as a as a giant fan base and player is is pretty cool. And then, um, you know, my wife uh, uh, talking about family. I, I have a two year old and a five week old, and a city that is not in another country, and that my wife has been to a million times and is really enjoys and and has some areas that we know we love. And and now, like I said, we're in the East Bay. We have a, a front yard and a backyard. We're not in a, on the forty eighth floor like we were in Toronto, and uh, it just it, it felt more comfortable to be honest when we, when we really like sat down and talked about it San Francisco just felt uh, felt like it was going to be more more of a home to us than Toronto was not that not to talk any smack about Toronto man we loved it but San Francisco just uh, it felt better and so far we're loving it hey to finish you up here last question I can't let you go without trying to make some money we talk all yeah. about it is there any moves in the market I need to make brother because I know <laughs> you've been watching so hold on let me get my pen and pad yeah, you know what? I, I got to get your number. You got to so the, it's a funny story, man. I went on Fox Business uh, years ago, and I said a name of a stock. And yeah. by the time I got off, I, I was getting hammered by um, <laughs> the the people you know where I work because it's a liability. Like if I tell you to go buy stock X Y Z and you go yeah. buy it and it goes mm -hmm. to zero the next day, that's a problem. You know, yeah. technically I solicited advice to you, so mm -hmm. uh, we we can talk off air. What I'll say is is what we've seen so far early this year is reasoning to always hold is reason to stay in the market is because the nasdaq's up 15 percent, the s p is up eight percent everyone thought we were going down even further and we still might but if you miss the big days like if you're trying to time the market and you miss the big five six seven days of the year you'll underperform that's what history has told you so um gotcha. you got to hold in the market and uh <laughs> let it work for you it's efficient and i'm 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 talking too much about my nerdy side but uh <laughs> love it no it, i love it but yeah no. get uh get my number and we'll talk off air because uh i'm always i'm always slinging some random stuff out there perfect no that that is the number one key i learned too was because i feel like a lot of people don't know this even if the market's down, Russ, right? The, it'll bounce back and there'll be like these hot days and then you'll, you'll pinpoint in a year, like a few days that jump the whole thing, which yeah. I guess you don't really realize. Like a lot of times it's kind of level. So when people pull out, that's what happens, right? Yeah, exactly. There'll be, you know, three, four, five days in a year where the, the market might be up 3% that day. And if you miss that day, you underperform. It's, it, yeah. it sounds stupid, but it's just math. It's, it's literally just math. You can't, you will not perform to, to the market if you miss those couple of days. There you go. Fresh. we got work to do, all right? To learn something. Ross, when you see Alex Wood today, tell him to come on the yeah. show because he's avoiding me like the plague. And I saw him in Did Chicago. Did you text him? I texted him about coming on. Then I talked to him in Chicago. He's like, I talk too much. Anyways. This is literally the perfect platform for Alex. I agree. Wood. So when you see Woody, you tell him that I said, that I told you to come on. 
or next time I see him, I don't know. I'm gonna go Gabe Kapler on him. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him know. He's he's pitching today, so I'll let him go uh, six shutty, and then I'll, when he's riding high, I'll be like, hey, I got this. I got this sweet show. You need to go on. So uh, perfect, we'll, perfect. We'll parlay it. Yeah, it'll be great. Perfect. Good perfect. plan. Hey, good luck tonight to the squad, Ross. We'll talk to you in a few weeks. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. See Appreciate you. you. Awesome. Yeah, Alex Wood. I mean, he's actually one of the most fiery guys on Twitter, I would say, in the entire game. Yeah. No? Yeah. One of the most open books. He's worried about what he's going to say. I just was kind of like, I don't know if it's the right time for me. And yeah, I'm like, Woody, did we play together? It's like, let's What's go. not the right time? He's a I veteran. He's been around I mean, for you know a how long it goes. time. You know, people are, sometimes people just are worried they're going to say the wrong thing. Some people care about that stuff, Scott. Not us, not the people on this show. <laughs> I will give you his number too, Fraze, if you want it. If you want to talk a few tips. All right. Yeah. Fraze Fr- Fr- is always looking for those tips, man. Yeah. Betting tips. Betting tips is another tips. story. That that listen. We've got a whole group chat with all of our uh all of our buddies in Vegas and all that. That's a good time. Keep going. Don't stop. I mean, I'm always hey, I get something here, boom, I'll share with everybody. Just like you know, we need, we need a betting tip on something. We got some help from people every once in a while. You can't do it all on your own. Boom. I agree. I agree. Hey, while we have a few minutes, I think Nevin's joining us pretty soon. I did want to shout out another big league manager who's going to set a Brewers record for games managed. So that should be tonight for Craig Council. It's pretty damn young. It's going to be the franchise leader in games managed at 1,181. He's wow. 52 years old. I think also he probably wants to manage for a while still, knowing Craig and how much fun he's having. But I will turn it over to Eric Kratz, who played for Craig Council, for the congrats and also what this dude's like and how long you think he's going to manage in the bigs. Because in my mind, you can make a case that he's number one on power rankings for actually in-game managing. At least, I would say, top three or five for – people making a case about how he manages a ball game. If you watch a lot of games and how, how he operates, you watch a ton of games too. Like he, he makes good moves. He takes his relievers or his starters out often, like right before you feel like they're about to implode your thoughts. No, absolutely. First congrats, Craig and your, and your incredible calves. Um, he's definitely <laughs> got the best calves in the game without a doubt. And you said he's 52. If you said he was 38, people would be like, yeah, I see it. The guy is, he's the Highlander. He doesn't age. But as far as like in-game management, bar none, he's incredible. And he does a great job of, he's a great listener. As much as he is funny and he has like his like, he has his things that he'll say. And you're like, wait a minute, that was, that was a zinger. Did he just say a zinger? And then he's out of the room already. Like it's, he has some funny things, but he is so locked in. You watch a game. He's very locked in. He's a great, great listener, too. He listens to Pat Murphy. He listens to Hookie. He listens to his analytic department. And ultimately, he's the one that makes the decision, and he owns up to it. His, he, he just is very – he's very aware of what's going on in the game, very intelligent for not being, like, a catcher slash, you know, the, the, the prototypical manager – but what he does really well is he gets the most out of his guys. And I, I didn't, I don't know what his reaction was to trading Hater. I don't know what his reaction was when they had to release Locaine, but I know what he puts into his relationships with his players. So I know it hurt him. And I know the next day he went on to whoever else they called up in each of those guys' places. Like he's a very, very good people manager, very good game manager. And if he wants to be able to ride his bike to any other big league stadium that he manages in, he's going to have to keep managing under the Brewers. And I hope the Brewers extend him because he should be there, but I don't know if he'll manage anywhere else. He loves being home. He is Wisconsin born and raised. He was a bat boy there. He is a pl- was a player there. And now he's the manager there. He is the, he is the cheese head. His dad worked for the ball club and very well said. And I'll say this because it was a, a theme of the day. He's a star, star manager. He's a star. <laughs> Just saying. He's a star. 100%. A I, I yep. say he's one of the, I say he's one of the top five in the game. Easy. Easy. Agreed. If not because of what he has. 
and where they get to. Mm -hmm. And he's and got dirt in his spikes. He's been doing it for a long time already. He has, but they haven't won the World Series, which I can't say top three if he hasn't won the World Series. I okay. think game managing wise, I think he is he is a top three, but I don't because they haven't won the World Series yet. Okay, fair. Well, we've got another manager to bring in the mix. A very good friend, some of us on this show. There he is, all queued up. Phil Nevin joining us right now, Angel Skipper. Why don't you why don't you intro your boy? Filthy Phil. I mean, he's the manager of the Angels. He. <laughs> I knew that's how this was going to get started. So, yeah. <laughs> so all right, I'm not even introducing him. He's the manager of the Angels. I've known Phil for 20 years, family well, the whole mm -hmm. deal. Uh, been on trips with him and the whole thing. So I'm disappointed he doesn't have the beard because he had the gray coming in. But before we even get started, you didn't hear earlier in the show. We knew we were bringing you on. We are talking about Gabe Kapler. Who wins in a fight? You or Gabe? Oh, a fight? Gee, we're too old for that stuff now, guys. Come on. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> uh, Gabe, Gabe's an ex-teammate of mine. Uh, he works out a lot more than I do. I'm getting there, but uh, it's – it's uh, no, we don't we don't fight. We, uh, we're too we're – good, we're good buddies, and you know, Gabe and I have got along for a long time. And I'll take you, though, AJ, any day. Oh, that, that, dude, that's what I was just going to ask next. I was going to say, listen, yeah, who wins Who wins in the fight, man? Unbelievable. Right, Phil and I have almost gone to blows a couple times. No right? Yeah, yeah. Over, uh, that's uh, what just friends dumb, are, that's Golf what shit, dumb do. golf shit. You know, friends <laughs> getting fight. I, Phil, I took you because I said you're going to get dirty. You're going to fight dirty. Gabe's going to be worried about get, being all clean, not ruining his tan. You're fighting dirty, <laughs> Phil. I know, listen, you're fighting dirty. Uh, speaking of looks, is this a hat backwards show? Do I got to go the other way? <laughs> yeah, it seems to be. Oh, I didn't get the memo, but that's that's how these guys uh, all kind of fit in together. But did he give an answer, though? Did no, he said they're friends. They'd never fight. Okay. Obviously, there's no official beef. It just became a theme where they were like, part of it was, Phil, people not realizing maybe if they don't know you or they haven't been around you, like, you know, Cap's got the whole Instagram spread going. You're, you're a big dude. You know, I wouldn't want to mess with Phil Nevin in a fight on the field. That's all I'm saying. No, I don't. I don't have the Instagram or any of that stuff either. I don't. I don't want people to find me. They know where to get me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, how's life right now um, with this ball club and what you've seen in the first couple of weeks? Give us your evaluation. Well, first off, you said how's life. Things are great, man. I. Uh, you were just talking about counts and him living at home and. Uh, I'm in the same situation. I get to be, you know, I grew up down the street. Uh, my high school was about four or five miles away. Obviously, Cal State Fullerton was right, right down the road. So I'm in, I'm in a lucky position. I really am. Um, you know, the people talk about the years and whatever I spent in the minor leagues. It's it's totally worth it uh, from what I, the experiences I had, the relationships I made with a lot of, you know, the three guys on this set, really. Uh, <coughs> to be in and to be in the position I am, uh, I'm, I'm not naive to the fact that I know not many first-year managers get to inherit the roster I have with two of the best players in the world, and we've added a nice support group around them. Uh, right now, we're playing, you know, okay baseball. We've, we've we kind of had some ups and downs here. We're 500. We just got done playing what I consider two of the best teams in the league in Seattle, and, and I tell you what, Toronto's really playing well. Uh, we lost a tough one last night, but uh, I got a great group. Uh, one thing I'm really proud of is the way that room is. Uh, we brought in some really quality character guys, individuals, and you can just sense in that room there's something special in there. I'm, I'm sure a lot of teams are going to say that right now. It's, you know, it's the right thing to say, right? But uh, I really believe in it. Um, our lineup is deep. Our starting pitching's done very well. And uh, I, if you look at the outlying numbers in our bullpen, you know, we've got a high strikeout rate. We haven't hardly walked anybody. The, uh, the, the the contact is uh, we've had we've given up a lot of weak contact lately that we know is going to change and we've hit a lot of balls hard that we know are going to change lately so uh, I really like where we're at. Phil, now first of all, I worked out with you quite often. You would beat Gabe's ass. Second, <laughs> you would definitely you would you definitely still working out don't i mean unless unless you stop that as a manager now you don't i mean you you rep more bicep curls than yandy diaz <laughs> like, <laughs> no i'm still there it's just i've added a little fluff around it that's the only problem okay okay that's fair that's fair because i'm Phil, a grandpa Phil actually now, started come on what you what 
I said, I'm a grandpa now, Kratzy. I don't have that much time. So. Oh, congrats. Phil Phil actually lost some weight the one year because why, Phil? Tell them why you lost weight and what was the precipice of you losing weight. Well, it actually happened twice in my years in New York. The first one was in the brawl we had with the uh, Red Sox, and Marcus was kind of carrying me off the field, my hitting coach now, and, and there was a picture, a side view of us, and I, I still have it on my phone. And the first and foremost – all I were doing was just pushing and shoving, you know, just trying to help out. And I couldn't get up the stairs when I walked back into the clubhouse, you know, those short stairs in Boston. I'm out of breath. I went up to our video guy and said, hey, can you show me a certain part of this? And I, I said, who's that? He goes, that's you. I went, oh, my God, I got to do something about this. Now, I, I had a few <laughs> shirts on. And I was a little. Uh, <laughs> but I got on the scale the next morning, just woke up right out of bed, not a stitch on, and I weighed 292. So, uh, I'm down to 240 ish right now, so it was about 50 pounds, and I did it over about a couple of years. But uh, and then you remember the second time I lost a little weight, I was a, a healthy, I got sick when I was there for, for a little while, but all good now. Hey, I, I want to talk about um, the Anthony Rendon situation a little bit. I know that was a little, little difficult to see, a little crazy, you know. I I kind of understand where he's coming from there. I, I would never touch somebody, but to interact with a fan, like I've done it before. I've, I've had interactions, but you know, what, what have you gotten out of that? And have you talked to him about the whole situation? We have, and, and, and you're right, Fraser. I mean, we've all been in that situation. We've all, you know, maybe made some mistakes as far as interacting with fans. I, I know I have, um, it, it, I'm sure AJ has somewhere along the line. It's just my guess, but. <laughs> I never grabbed it. I think I wanted to. <laughs> in fact, I think there was an incident in San Francisco, wasn't it? You didn't touch anybody, but there was birds. I just gave him the old. Uh, yeah, there you go. Finger. Yeah, had an itch on your. I had an itch, right? And I got called into the office the next day by Sabian. He's like, "What is this?" And I go, "I had an itch." And he goes, "I don't know if that's an itch. We need to scratch." <laughs> Did you get in trouble? Yeah. Not publicly. Not publicly. Okay. Not publicly. Well, the, the situation with Anthony and and. I think he's a very misunderstood guy being around him over the last year. There's a lot of leadership qualities that have come out. He, uh, you know, he was injured most of last year. He chose to stay with us as a group and really became kind of a leader of this team, uh, you know, through his voice, through his actions. Uh, I know he's heard all the, per, you know, the, the adjectives about him. He's not on the field. He doesn't care. I couldn't, disagree with that more first off you don't win playoff mvps unless you care about this game you care about your teammates uh he wants to win he's been a great part of this from the beginning of spring training uh it was an unfortunate incident where you know two people they they ended up talking a, a couple of days later you know i was i was around him when it happened and he had anthony felt terrible the fan felt terrible um and i'll, I'll leave it at that they had a great conversation uh, Anthony actually came up, took his jersey off, and went that, back down to talk to the guy because he, he did feel bad about what actually happened. Uh, you know, he's sensitive to the fact when people talk about his, you know, some injuries and things that he's had, and, and he's ready to go. He, unfortunately, he took 98 off the tip of the shoulder yesterday from two days ago from Romano, so he's a little banged up right now. Uh, but he's going to be fine. He, he told me this morning he wants to play tonight. You know, the one thing I love about Anthony is like he knows how to play the game. You put him in the lineup the at-bat you're going to get, uh, his baseball intellect, his instincts are, are, are better than anybody on the field when he's out there. So we need him. Uh, he knows that. The players uh, really rally around him. They love him. Uh, he's just somebody in the clubhouse that you you flock to. And and uh, I think it's a, a big misconception of who Anthony Rendon is. Stepping aside from Anthony specifically, I learned from these guys that the setup in Oakland is different from any other ballpark where the guy, the players have to come out in a section where fans are also located, and it's the only ballpark that has that. Should that be changed? I, I'm just surprised that, that you're you're kind of asking for a situation that could lead to an altercation. And I'm on the fan side of looking at this going, I don't right. think that's right. Uh, no, you're, you're exactly right. It is the only place where we walk actually through the fans. Um, yeah, they can. I mean, honestly, they can reach out and touch you. I watched a fan do that a couple of years ago to Aaron Judge, tried to reach over and grab his hat. And fortunately, we had a security guy, our guy with the Yankees, right next to him and uh, made sure the hat wasn't uh, took, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. But 
they've actually narrowed that area down. There is some security in there. I think it does need to be better, but you know, I've had some, I have, I have some friends that are coaches in the NBA that I actually spoke to after that. How do you guys do this every day? They actually have people, fans sitting on their bench. And I know there's been interactions between player and fan all the time in the NBA. Uh, and we get a little taste of that in Oakland. Um, uh, the Oakland fans are very passionate. I mean, I know there's not a lot of them that go there, but the A's fans that are there, they're very passionate people. And uh, this was just a case of guys getting, you know, the, the, the emotions getting the best of them. It was opening day. Uh, and like I said, both parties uh, apologized and they, they made up over the phone. But you're exactly right. It's a tough situation to walk through. Uh, you know, we're not used to it. And, and that's exactly why. I mean, we talk about it before the game, sure. Uh, but it's really not something that baseball players have to do except for one place. Now, the team that you have, you have the two best players in the world on your team, and a lot of people would say, okay, well, record-wise, you've underachieved. You were the bench coach for – you were the third base coach, sorry, for the Yankees in 2020, and we were underachieving. 2020 season was tough. We go into Buffalo – and we lost the first game in Buffalo, and it was a makeshift. <laughs> it was a makeshift clubhouse. Now, would you take the same approach to get this team fired up that you took that day in Toronto that we did go out and win when you ran through the clubhouse with all 270 pounds of you and nothing else <laughs> on through the clubhouse, butt naked, getting the boys hype? Will you do that as a manager, and is or is that against the rules as a manager? Now that you're button up, Phil Nevin, I'm the manager of the Los Angeles Angels. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess there's nothing sacred on this uh, show here. I figured that with you guys, but um, it's different times, right? Uh, it's the COVID deal. We had nobody else in the clubhouse but us. It was a boys kind of club situation, and. Uh, Thought we needed a little spark, and I just got out of the shower. Someone ripped off my towel, so I just went flying through the clubhouse. And, you know, congrats. <laughs> uh, I think I jumped through a wall, maybe, or a wall fell they had, over. <laughs> they had partitions. I mean, it's not even, it doesn't even exist anymore, but it was in Buffalo because the Blue Jays were playing in Buffalo because the one niner was getting everybody in Toronto, so we weren't allowed yep. up there. And they had partition. It was just a full everything. It was like a big, huge party tent. And they made partitions to, to dissect, you know, the analyst room, the manager's room, our clubhouse. And Phil was full speed and he couldn't stop or he was trying to like hit the wall when the wall <laughs> wasn't a wall and it was a partition and it just went <laughs> like a wall from uh, like when like when the dog in uh, the sandlot, the wall fell on fell on a. Uh, Ah, oh, piss. What's the dog's name in San Gary anyway. Sanchez, but it, it did fall on Gary. It did fall on Gary, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got personality coaches for that now, but uh, we'll see. Okay, good. We'll see. You never know. Hopefully we don't get in those situations, but every team goes through ups and downs, and you got to find a way to get out of them, right? One of the, hey, Crouchy, one of the things I never thought I would hear is Phil Nevin, manager speak only now. He has completely changed since he's become the he's manager. Trained. He's trained well by his personality coach to only say, this is what I meant to do. I'm no longer allowed. I'm no longer allowed to do that because I'm the manager. <laughs> so, so let's go back to your playing days, Phil. One of my favorite stories about you, and we had this conversation because I think you ended up getting traded to Texas after this, is that you were at the Padres. You're doing great. Petco, the whole deal. You guys were rocking. They're like, we're going to trade you. And you had 10-5 rights. You're like, no, you're not going to trade me. I'm going to stay here. Right? They called you in the office and said, okay, you're not staying. Guess what? You're going to be a fucking catcher tomorrow and you're going to catch in a game. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute. I'm going to take that trade now. Can you tell that story for us? <laughs> uh, there's some truth to that. It was, I had a no trade clause of a certain amount of teams. I was getting right at my 10 5 where that was going to get. Uh, obviously, I would take over. But um, you know, Kevin Towers and I, who, you know, the great friend who's passed, who's passed along a couple years ago. Um, like you and I, AJ, our friendship, we kind of had, was like a, you know, we fought like brothers once in a while. And, uh, yeah, it, uh, they had me come in and catch one day. I caught that day. I did. I ended up getting thrown out of the game, I think, in the seventh inning. I had to lose the game because I, 
I could not feel my legs anymore. I got, not squatted in about three years, and uh, I had to get out of the game. And I, and I ended up getting kicked out on a – Scott Linebrink made a good pitch that was borderline, and I just said, all right, this is my time. This is my chance to get out of here right now. So, uh, But, yeah, and I got traded to Texas the next day. Um, I loved my time in San Diego. I loved Kevin Towers. You know, we had – we got we went at it a few times, but – even after my career, uh, we became such really good friends and went on that Pebble Beach golf trip for a couple of years. We were partners, and, and then, uh, unfortunately, he got the cancer and, and uh, has left us. But, uh, no, I, I, like I said, we, we certainly all have had some moments back in our days, and uh, that was one of mine. Yeah. <laughs> did you need to be – did you need to – now that you know, you know, you've been a manager, has it been a full year yet, or have you, you're coming up on a year? Uh, I, t- I took over in June about last year, so okay. we're getting there. So it's short. Now, looking back on it, did you need to be in the minor leagues as a as a manager to learn to, you know, do what you're doing now, or could you have been up earlier? Well, I mean, I, I think I, I went through some managerial interviews, and, you know, you're always thinking you're ready, right? And I think each stop along the way has just taught me more and more through experiences, through relationships, uh, being a part of the Yankee organization was was fantastic and how they run things, the Giants as well, the Diamondbacks, the Tigers. I think everywhere you go, you, you know, you take those experiences and learn from them. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's, there's always, we're always going to the ballpark, you know, we want to learn something new and, and, you know, there's always something that'll come up and get you. Uh, but the more experiences you can have throughout the minor leagues, and I'm just, I, you know, I know there's plenty of guys that you got, you were talking about Craig council earlier, earlier. Uh, never coached, never managed at any level. He was in the front office and went down and there's a learning curve for him. I'm sure if you talk to him, uh, he'll tell you the same thing, but he had really good people around him. And I think the better people you can surround yourself with, uh, the better off you're going to be. Uh, I certainly take a lot of pride in the, the relationships I've made in the past, uh, past managers, coaches I've worked with, organizations I worked for, general managers, uh, presidents, everything. Uh, you take a little bit from from every little piece of where you've been, and I think it makes us all better. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, I I think the more time you spend down there, the better off you're going to be. But uh, I, I feel like I'm really in a good place. I, I love the relationships with the players. I love going to the park every day, as we did when we were players. Uh, but you do have to learn how to separate those, uh, you know, player to coach or manager. And uh, I feel like the experiences down there have helped me do that. Hey, talking about managing players, different player like Shohei Otani. I mean, he's a two-way player. How, how do you manage him? I know he doesn't want to ever come out, but at the same time, he's got to pitch and he's got to hit. He's, he's the most diverse player, and he's probably the best player in the big leagues right now. So how do you manage that and, you know, go from there? You know what, Frage? With Shohei, it's almost like, what do you need? What, you know, are you done? Or is it – and it's, it's really – there's a lot of fact to it. Uh, you know, this guy's preparation before games, the things he does to get ready to play a game – not just physically, but mentally uh, studying. Uh, it's nothing short of amazing. It's it's something I've never seen before. I can assure you guys, if you are around this every day, there's a huge wow factor. Uh, you know, to be able to, he doesn't, you know, he never hits on the field. He never takes batting practice on the field. He does everything inside. He has to manage, you know, what his pitching stuff is, what his hitting stuff is. He understands how much the sleep is important to him, his nutrition and he doesn't miss a beat. Uh, he's the most prepared, organized, uh, routine-oriented person I've ever been around. Uh, he wants to be the best player in the game, uh, and there's reasons why he is. Phil, conversation you've had with Otani and the last combo you've had with Trout. Obviously, you're talking to them every day. It could be baseball, non-baseball. I think part of what we're doing on this show, too, is just trying to give good access to how great the personalities are, even if they're not necessarily giving you these incredible sound bites, say, like you'll get from some players in the <laughs> NBA. These are interesting, intricate dudes that have other interests. So give us a little insight on each of them. Well, easy with Mike. Uh, when, it, when it's not a baseball-related topic, we're always, it's always golf. Uh, you know, he's building a golf course. He loves the game. Uh, we played a couple times this winter. He actually went out and played with my son. He took my son out one day, who's my youngest, who's with the Dodgers. Uh, he loves, absolutely loves the game. Um, and we have mutual friends through the golf community. But you know, we just had our golf pool again for the Masters, which uh, 
I think the managers won three out of the last four boys. I, I get, I don't know how this works, but you just pick out of these tiers and I've won the last three. So they're killing me on why and my golf knowledge, but it's honestly, I'm just pulling names out of a hat kind of, and I've won the last few, but uh, Mike is just, he's enthralled with the, with the game. Uh, he's a pr really good player. As you can imagine, he hits it a mile, but a lot of our conversations focused around golf with Shohei, uh, what people don't understand is he, he's such a big personality. He's funny. He, you know, but we've actually gone to a couple dinners. And so we talk about food a lot, sushi and, you know, he loves in and out when he's here. Um, but we've, he's taken me to some really cool sushi restaurants and taught me kind of the art of, you know, that cuisine, which is really cool. I've always enjoyed it and been to Japan a couple of times, but, uh, he's really a, a, an intriguing person away from the baseball field. He's somebody that, uh, you know, first off, really cares about his teammates, but he is so focused on being the best player in the world and it just watch the ball works. Um, and then some of the things that, you know, I just kid him about, you know, the cars he's driving or where, you know, he's he's got such a big, great personality. He's funny. Uh, he loves interacting with his teammates, and that's just something that not a lot of get, people get to see. Do people notice him? In who, who gets noticed more in Anaheim? Mike Trout or Shohei Atani? I would say Shohei probably. He, he doesn't, you know, I, you know I'm not going to speak for him, but, yeah, he's very – he's really worldwide. Um, you know, I can't imagine he can uh, go outside much. And he's very recognizable. Um, uh, you know, the ads in our up on our scoreboard, he's got some, like, commercials now for skincare products. We make fun of him. There's these ads they run <laughs> up on the scoreboard where he, hey, he's a, he's a model. He looks like a model up there, you know, and he's doing his acting and stuff. And the guys kind of, you know, mess around with him. And he just kind of does this. It's <laughs> the money. <laughs> What's the funniest thing that Otani's done? You said he's funny. You said he's got a big personality. What's the funniest thing since you've been a manager that he's done? Well, he we do our pregame uh, handshakes and stuff, and we have one, and I kind of screwed it up one day, and he had to walk all the way underneath and come back and make me redo it just because I tell you, it's, it's part of his routine, but him just making fun of me, and he'll tap me on one shoulder, and he'll move to the next shoulder, and – you know, you know, I'm looking around like this. He's just, there's so many little tiny things that you don't need. It's, there's not a really a language barrier. He's, uh, we're able to communicate, you know, very well. Uh, I'm learning some Japanese words. He's learning, you know, he's very, you know, getting a lot better with his English and he wants to learn it to interact with his teammates. And then there's this hat. I don't know where this thing came from, but, uh, our home run hat, which I like to see brought out a lot, obviously, uh, it's heavy for one. These things keep breaking off, but uh, I'm not sure if he designed it or what, but he's had some funny things to say about it that maybe we can't repeat. <laughs> Epic. I love it. Let's, let's, let's choose, let's choose your own adventure. Let's take it back to 2020. Your ending. We lost in uh, ALDS to the Rays, and it's looking like possibly you could be the Tigers manager. How does that, like, everything kind of falling out of place for you not to become the manager and then going back to the Yankees, how was that situation? Like, you were doing the interviews, and it was 2020, so it was like everything's online and you're close to home as we're at the – we're in the bubble. Like, how does yeah. that – how would that have changed? You know, you're, you're – how would that have changed your trajectory? You, you know, as you thinking possibly you could get that job. I mean, I can tell you exactly how it changed mine. I, I, I had been through some interviews in the past, uh, maybe three or four or five years in a row uh, when I was with the Diamondbacks and then a few years with the Yankees. But I really felt like this might have been my last chance, you know. And if it didn't happen, it didn't happen. I, I loved where I was at with the Yankees. I was working for one of my best friends and Aaron Boone. And uh, But when I didn't get the job, I, was I disappointed? Certainly. Uh, you know, I kind of thought that was, I, I really thought that was, the, that was it. I'm going to coach for a few more years um, and then probably go watch my kids play. You know, I haven't got to see either one of my boys play too many games live in my life. Uh, get to watch them on TV now, but uh, I really thought that was it. And uh, I spent one more year with the Yankees and then with, uh, it wasn't going to work out there anymore. Uh, I was at a point where I, I just really thought I was done and Perry called to, uh, 
you know, asked me to come over and be the third base coach. And we sat down several times. Originally, I was was not going to do it. I was not. You know, I just thought, like I said, I thought I was done. And, and uh, it was close to home. It was it was near uh, where I grew up. And to put an angel uniform on and be around the people I was with, kind of full circle, if you will. Uh, I had a good relationship with Joe Madden. Uh, when I came over last year, he was a coach with the Angels when I played here. Uh, so I just thought it would be a good fit. I'm close to home. Um, and uh, it just worked out this way. Not exactly how I planned it uh, at all, but certainly uh, when it did happen, uh, embracing it and, and tackling it head on. And it's something that I've obviously, as you guys know, wanted to do for a long time. And uh, I really love what I'm doing. Did Are you and Aaron Boone still tight? Because you guys were best friends. You were you, pretty much yeah, best very, friends. Yeah, you're we, still we, you're still tight, even though it didn't work out. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, okay. Good. No, I, I I was hoping you would say that. I didn't want you to say no. We hate each other now. We're gonna fight <laughs> no, like no, me, no, you no. and Kapler. We, 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 <laughs> we had we we probably talked. I would guess on a, every other day basis, you know, especially through spring training because we spent four of those together. We lived in houses right next door to each other, watching The Bachelorette every uh, Monday night and then watching old highlights of us every <laughs> other night. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Yeah. So, and, and then the last thing before we let you go, Eric Kratz in our pre-production meeting today said, if Phil Nevin gets the Tigers job, he asked me to be his bench coach. True or false? Uh, don't shake your head, Kratzy. You know I called you. So, uh, I think Kratzy will be, this is, he won't be behind a TV camera too often. Uh, not that it, not that he doesn't have a look for it. You look great, Kratz. <laughs> uh, he's just, you know, there's just people you, relationships you create along the way that you understand what kind of baseball guys they were. Uh, he's going to be whatever he wants to in this game. I'm not trying to pump you up any more than, <laughs> than these guys probably do. But seriously, one of the best baseball guys I've been around. Uh, he cares. Uh, I believe we shed some tears after we lost that game that you were talking about together. Uh, because that was your last one, and I remember that. Uh, but there's certain people in this game that you just know that will be superstars in whatever they do, and I know Kratzy will, and I did reach out to him. I don't know if it was specifically for the bench coach job, but I definitely called him to be a part of the staff, sure. Nice. Congratulations. Jeez, we end on that note. You know, we were... No, that was great. That was great. That was <laughs> awesome. I didn't have anything. Kratzy's yeah, he's almost in tears. Yeah, that's a great way to finish. That was awesome. Yeah, I love that. I well, noticed I didn't get a phone call. Uh, yeah. No. Uh, well, you guys got in fights. He doesn't want to get in fights with you. He said you're like kicking the golf ball. Who the wins? And- who win? Hey, who win? Who wins in golf between you two? Oh, Phil. Phil. Oh, God. Wait, wait, wait. I had, I had, I've had way more years off than he has. To play more golf. Phil, Phil's I a better golfer than I am. So, Phil, you're a way better golfer than AJ? Because I had AJ – I haven't golfed with him yet, but I had AJ mm-hmm. higher up in the golf mm-hmm. echelon. I will not say way better, no. He's better. But better. I mean, he's, he's a better <laughs> golfer. I can admit it. He's a better golfer than me. I've, play, I've, been, I've played for a long time. I, it's not quite what it used to be but because uh, I don't get to play as often. But, no, I, I, uh, if I were to, I'll take AJ straight up if that's what you're asking, but I'm not going to give him that many. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait, Phil's all, wait, you're 50, how old, 50 what? 52, and I'll say this, the first, when we first started playing golf, when AJ first retired, he was absolutely awful. When we used to play on those Nike trips, I mean, it was sprayed here and there, and then we get into these, we played this tournament in Orlando, and now there's fans involved, we're playing with the LPGA girls, and uh, I, we, AJ, I believe we got paired up one time, and I was astonished how well he played how much improvement he's made like anything i mean i think we're just competitive people and you don't want to suck at anything and especially in a competition level and uh aj certainly is one of those guys and his game has gotten really good i can i feel like i can take him to any course now and not be embarrassed you know what i mean yes thank you thank you like the time we went to oakmont that time for the u.s open and we both embarrassed ourselves at that day oh yeah remember that day that was that was one of those days we're not going to talk about on tv Hey, Phil, I hope you enjoyed this, man. This was fun. It was great catching up with you. Yeah, of course, you're not going to be worlds ahead of AJ. You got to go manage Trout, Otani, yeah. and, and the damn Angels. So go get them tonight against the Nats, and we'll talk again soon, all right? I agree. Thank you, guys. It was a great show. I had a good time. Uh, we'll get Frazier talking next time, though, would we? <laughs> <laughs> They're t- I know he can talk.
uh, hey. his brother because I managed his brother in AAA also. So, uh, some, how's he some, doing? So he's doing well. Thank you. He's doing well. He's teaching at the high school. But hey, when when they they get rolling, you gotta let them go. You gotta know your place. So I I'll, I'll get you next time. No worries. I got it, pal. Good to see you. <laughs> All right, brother. You Appreciate too, you, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Sorry. Thanks, Philly. Awesome. Love nice. that. He's calling out Kratz for his inside story. Huh? No, I, I wanted to hear the story because that's awesome. Like, think yeah, about Kratz. He, he he knew he was done playing, and then he gets a call from a guy that thinks he's going to be a big league manager to be a coach on his staff. That's all. That's an awesome yeah. story. Like, that deserves more credit than, you know, it's a guy that sits out for a couple of years. Like, you, because Phil just coached him with the Yankees. And Phil said, I want you to be on my staff right away. That's a great credit to Eric Kratz. It was, it was, it was an honor. And, and he was, you know, when you, when you think back to like getting calls like that and like relationships you have with guys, yeah, Scotty, you're right. Like it's, it's emotional because like, you're not talking about me as a player. You're not like, Oh my gosh, he knows the game so much. Like he was talking about the relationships that we had and, you know, the relationships of the guys around me. And, you know, he, he didn't know what his role would have been if he had gotten that job. He didn't know exactly what he could offer, but for him to reach out to me and, and say something, you know, he, he called me after his interview and I had only let a few people know that I wasn't going to play anymore. Um, and, you know, he had reached out to me and, and asked that, and it was definitely something that was an honor for sure. All right, Fraser, you ready to make some people some money? Money, money, money. Let's do it, okay? Yeah. It's time for Locks, presented by Bet MGM. First off, let's recap. And, Fraze, you weren't on with us on Monday, but I will add this for you because you dropped three-something to win 300, and you banged it on Friday. So we'll show that in a second. But for Monday's mm-hmm. Locks, we'll get to the annoying part at the end. But AJ, money, good call. Scherzer and the Mets bouncing back, Woo-hoo. 135 to win. A hundo. I like Kip going with the first five. Nats and Angels, there was eight runs up on the board. So he hit that over easy, 110 to win a hundo. Or I think he went higher than that. I think he might have put two something down. But we'll check that later. Uh, Kratzy, you fell with the Rays? Again, yeah. I, I twice, mean, bro. The, half, the, the hook is getting you, brother. The heck? The, the hook got me. The hook got me the other day with the Rockies. It's okay. I'm, I, I'm, I'm enticed. I love seeing that plus. That plus 120 just... <laughs> just it just brings me in and i like Reels it I, in. i'm all i'm all about it bring me the pluses bring me the pluses give me the upsets baby um i <laughs> went with a with a favorite and alcantara and the boys let me down yesterday if you missed you were earlier due. in the you show were due. you were do i was due i was due you got to come back down to earth eventually and you know what i didn't sweat through it either it was just straight up an absolute wreckage. The <laughs> Phillies destroyed the That game was over when they scored five. You know it would have like been worse? Ninth times. inning and they fall by a run or something, and I would have been like, fuck. I didn't even need to watch most of the game. So thank you for that. I'm 7-1, up 595. Is that right? Five ninety. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. Nice. It is. 595. Okay. I'm still in good shape. Kratzy, you're up 2250? Oh, no, no. It's $225. Don't worry about the... The decimal. No, it's We're 22, 22, 22, 50. When are we going to get rid of those 50 cents? You got to do some bet to balance that out. I got to figure out. I got to yep. figure out how to bet to 73 cents so that so that Claudia really has to like start really typing it in. Uh, it's like point blah, 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 all the decimal stuff. And then there's yeah. Kip um, who actually, you know, obviously starts out hot up 100 bucks. AJ's got work to do. So now let's do our bet MGM locks of the day for Tuesday. AJ Prusinski coming off. A no, dub. I'm going last. You're going last? Yeah, I have a special pick today. Okay. Todd he Frazier, doesn't remember his pick. For That's what it is. He no, doesn't no, remember. There Not is true. something special. There's there is something, something special, special about I agree. my great we'll, we'll go last. Todd Father first. Well, I'm. this is, uh, I'm going with this, but I'm not really like excited about it. But for me, I'm going um, Blue Jays. Minus one and a half. So they got to win by two. I, I think it's at minus 135. So I'm going with an easy mm-hmm. 135 to win to win 100. So I'm not going big on this one. I do like the Blue Jays to win. Um, I do like them to win convincingly. But, you know, I like it. I don't love it. Uh, but I'm sticking with it. I think the Blue Jays are going are gonna to roll through this game. They're going to win convincingly, but I don't love it. 
Again. It's not his favorite lock. Oh, yeah. It's not his favorite lock. <laughs> just, Is that what you're saying? You didn't love AJ, this I'm just AJ, trying to be. I'm going to wig eventually, but I don't love it. Trust wait, me. Wait, next time, we, the next show you and me are on, I'm going to pinpoint every little problem you got. It's not going to be fun for you. So <laughs> I just, keep, I'm just going. asking Listen, I, if I want to bet. I'm not I, I'm, making a I'm, problem. I'm telling you. There's going to be a bigger problem. It's okay. Keep going. We're going to have a problem in a few minutes, actually. But, Kratzy, you're up. All right. I got Minnesota at... One and a half, minus one and a half at plus 140. I got sucked in by the plus again. But I'm putting 200 down on that so that I can get my 280 back in the pocket. I love Lopi on the mound with Lopi in the bullpen. They got Duran coming out of the bullpen. It's going to be a short game with Pablo Lopez starting. And then – I the, the issue I'm going to see is in the sixth inning, how are they going to bridge it to, to Alcala, who hasn't given up a, a run this year, and then to Lopi and Duran in the bullpen. You know, maybe if they got to bring in a lefty matchup with Thielbar, I'm, I'm seeing this game being about a three-run game. So that's why I took the one and a half. There you go. See, that was kind of like me yesterday. The bu, 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 Eric Kratz. No, yeah. that was good. That's what we want, though. I want the details on why you went there. And here, AJ and me are going to tag team on why we have the same damn pick, Texas money line, or run line, I should say, minus 130. We're both going 130 to win a hundo. DeGrom against Jordan Lyles. 11-2 yesterday. Rangers offense looking good. Bobby Witt hasn't gotten going yet. The Royals offense looks terrible. And DeGrom's last start, six innings, one and run, two hits, two walks, 11 Ks. He got rocked the first time around. Especially at home. Especially at home. Especially in Texas. The ball flies there. Jordan Lyles has not got off to a good start. I think Rangers, they're scoring a lot of runs. Their offense looks really good. DeGrom's going to go out, throw that four-seamer, a little changeup, a little cutter at 100. And uh, I think I think the Rangers win this one by three or four runs, and it's a pretty easy win for, for the boys. Who's tailing this with us? Podfather, you want some of this? It's a good lock. Yeah, DeG- anything DeGrom I'm going with for sure. Okay, Is cool. The money, did you say the money line or the run line? Run, run line, line, run line. Money line's too steep. Run line is minus 130. Uh, money <laughs> line's probably like... Money line was like minus two something. As it should be, as it should be. The Rangers should be pretty heavily favored in a matchup like this. They're playing good ball right now, and they need to win these games too if they're going to try and make some noise in the AL West because the AL West is off to a slow start. There's your locks. They're on the board. And MLB Bet 10 to win 200 is still going strong. Download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android. Sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into your newly created account. Then place a pregame money line wager of at least 10 bucks on any MLB team at standard odds price. You receive $200 in bonus bets. Instantly, the bonus code is SPICYBALL200. You see it on the screen there. And always bet responsibly. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER few things I want to get to, and then we'll do some slap hands as well. I just wanted to finish up on, first off, props to the Rays. Still undefeated. Mm-hmm. They pull up a one nothing game, and, and bases loaded jam for Colin Poche against Rafael Devers. He punches him out. So, all right, cool. We see you, Rays. Um, and they're playing them tonight again. No one touched the Rays tonight, huh? Because no. it's McClanahan, right? The line was too high. Yeah, line's too high. Line too high for my, my blood. I also want to call out, going back to Texas for a moment, did you guys see Andrew Heaney? Nine Solid. consecutive Ks. That's Broke. incredible. Did he break the, break the record, Nolan Ryan's record, he, or no? He tied the record tied in the American League. Okay. In the national, and that's with uh, – do you know who has the record in the American League, by the way, the two pitchers? Andrew Heaney. Well, Heaney's one. Yeah, he just did it. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Doug Fister in 2012. That's right. I remember, remember that. that. Yes. That was wow. ridiculous. But he wasn't a strikeout guy. He was a sinker ball, big curveball guy. And then Tyler Alexander, I put Anderson, but I meant Alexander in the American League, if you guys were looking at the rundown thing, which I don't know if you do. And then in the National League, the record's 10. So it's Tom Seaver in 1970, and then it didn't happen again until 2021, Aaron Nola and Corbin Burns, both fan 10 in a row. AJ, do you remember uh, Ian Snell with the Pirates? Mm -hmm. He came down from the big leagues, and he was throwing an Indy, and he struck out. It was either 12 or 13 in a row. Walked the first guy of the game, and then he struck out 12 or 13 Toledo Mudhens in a row. It was in Indy. You couldn't see when the sun was setting, and they did not stand a chance. Their dugout cheered the one time when 
they fouled a ball over over their dugout. It was like the seven hitter fouled a ball over the dugout, and that was the first guy to have made contact. <laughs> I don't know if your brother was on that team, Todd, or not, but it was it was around yeah. it was around that time. But that was that was impressive. So nine in the show is the real deal. Hey, Fridge, we got a problem. Hold up, run it. Top father, you know, I, I heard you had a relaxing evening and there, there weren't any personal problems for the family in the baseball world, but your foul territory family experienced an issue. Do you want to hand yeah. it off? No, I'm going to hand this one off. I mean, when there's a good day, you just relax, sit back, and let other have somebody where, else take where care Where were of you? Me. The Poconos? Where did you say you I were? Was the Pocon- I was a Kalahari in the Poconos, a little water park with the family. I got my phone wasn't buzzing. It was perfect day. So tomorrow's nice. a new day, though. But I'm gonna pass this one to AJ. I think AJ this is, has a problem. This is why it was a good day because you didn't have to watch this, and I did since I watch every White Sox game. They played the they they played the Twins yesterday, and there was like three times where the Twins guy ran over a White Sox guy, and it was totally in the scope of the play. Here's one first base. Christian Vasquez ran over Jake Berger, clearly not anywhere near him trying to go get him, and then unfortunately Tim Anderson got hurt on the next one in a rundown where you can see where he is. And the, and the runner try, still tries to go around him, but the, the White Sox kind of messed up the rundown. And Tim Anderson, again, unfortunately hurt his knee and is out for a while. But then on the broadcast, I got to hear Steve Stone say that dudes on the Twins are going out of their way to wipe guys out. Like, they were not trying to do that. And I, I know we're supposed to be homers and people like their homer guys on their TV. But, Steve, come on. They're not trying to hurt another guy. They're not trying to run him over. So, please, Todd, as you would say, I got a problem. Steve, I got a problem with you saying that. Crazy, Strong. man. I Strong. like Stoney. I like Stoney too, man. He's he's always he's been there a lot for a long time. So it just sometimes he just maybe he missed a call, just like an umpire or a player on the field. So Fair. Give, give him give him the benefit of the doubt for this one. Next one, we'll come back and talk to him. I think he's <laughs> frustrated. I like that. I think he's frustrated just because of the injuries. I mean, we talked about it a little earlier with Rosenthal. Now Tim Anderson out two to four weeks. Aloy Jimenez is out with the hammy. I mean, we're two weeks into the Mikata's season. Mikata's missing the whole series with the Twins because of back. Those problems. are the names. It's the same problem again. So what, whether it's the result of a collision play like that or not, it just it's frustrating for White Sox fans. You can speak to it more than I can. I don't watch every single White Sox game, but that's probably what Steve Stone's feeling. It's like, can you <laughs> stop running our guys over? So I, I feel that. All right, let it, ready for a little slap hands action? We've got a lot to do during slap hands. Let's run that. Okay, so just to recap too, if you missed earlier, Ian Anderson, likely Tommy John surgery uh, this week, uh, reported by Mark Bowman, who was on the show the other day, AJ missed him. But that's a, I don't want to say a big loss for the Braves, because he wasn't even a factor at all last year. But it's just crazy to see, you think it's a big factor for the Braves, Kratzy? What do we talk about every single day? Some type of injury, some type of like, well, these guys are going to be this good. He was part of their depth. He's part of the reason that, hey, when so-and-so goes down, they have this guy to call up. Well, they don't have him now. And the guy, I mean, he was he was a World Series winner. He was elite in the playoffs. And you don't, he's not, he's not going down there like, ah, well, you know, I'm probably not going to be that good. He's going to get himself back to be that guy, I think it does hurt. Yes, it doesn't hurt today or next week, but at some point that depth has been, you know, that armor has been, has been, you know, a little bit of a, a little bit of a hit. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Phrase. I mean, the, the East in general has taken quite a few hits injury wise already, right? Verlander's coming back hopefully soon for the Mets. Of course they don't have Diaz. Philly's dealing with no Harper for a while. Hoskins goes down. Braves dealing with some injuries here. Braves are a deep team, though. So that, the only thing for me is, in my mind, Frazier, I don't think it changed anything. I still think the Braves are the cream of the crop in the East. Yeah, I mean, who's going to stay around 500 until everybody gets healthy? I mean, that's that's what I'm thinking here. A uh, couple games over. But, yeah, the Braves are doing what they do. Bottom line is, this is, this is how the season's going. People are getting injured left and right. Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to step up and find a way to win those games late? And uh, – 
focus on not worrying about the injuries and focus on winning and getting to that 500 level in a month or two into the season and taking off from there. Because once you get all your stallions, once you get all your horses, next thing you know, boom, some, some team's going to take off and they're not going to look back. Yeah, and the Braves say hey, they were fine last night in a walk-off 5-4 um, in the 10th down a run. Sean Murphy, who I think is going to be great for them, hit his first home run Speaking of as a death, Brave. They went out and got him, and Travis Darno goes down with a concussion. Who's, who they got? They got a gold glove catcher. He's got some pop, hits you big homer. So, I mean, the Braves are deep, but there's only so, so much depth any organization can have. Yep. One more shout-out for me from games yesterday. I just want to keep – I'm going to keep shouting this out until it stops. Not only are the Rays undefeated, Jordan Walker hasn't gone a game in his big league career yet without a knock. So, he's at 10. Good for him. And he's, nice. what, 20? So, props to him. Kratz hats, what do you got today? Well, the first, uh, I guess Kratz hats is getting a little bit of pub. The Mama Juanas of Lehigh Valley, I don't pigs, sent me this hat, sent me a couple other hats, so I'm going to get to get to rock it. This is the first non-game. Well, actually, most of my hats are non-game because I, I put a pot on the, on my head and sit behind the dish. But this is, this is a, a gift from the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs, part of their Copa de Diversial. And it's it's a pretty sick logo. I'm I'm excited about this whole Copa series. Say the name again. You just your inflection. The Mama is, Wanas. Yeah, Mama. beautiful, beautiful. Rolls off the tongue for Kratzy, and he does the translating for us, which I didn't realize we needed that. And he's done it beautifully. As Andre Semenes interviews True. are world famous at this point. All right, two more things. Ready? AJ sent this in the text group yesterday. I did. Oh no, Kratzy did. I and did. he goes, this would like, be wait, AJ what I... Pruszynski as an outfielder. Wait, Ready? What, what is this? Wait, wait. This is overseas. Oh, hell yeah. I've seen this. Hell seen yeah. This? Except I would have waited longer. Look at him. This, this dude's throwing the confetti. It's like Trisha Whitaker celebrating the Rays winning the AL East yesterday. <laughs> like, yeah, high five. Yeah, look, look. The catcher's like, yep, suck it, dude. You're out. Like, point he, to the he, fans. He rounded the bases. <laughs> and, he's like, wait. and then the other team's like, yeah, <laughs> look at him. <laughs> this is all AJ. Crowd. Yeah, dude, that, oh, was, AJ. that was the coolest thing ever because he catches it. He's so not, he like jumps over the fence, catches it. He's like, doo, doo, doo. and then obviously, you just see him throw the ball in. And then, if you, you can't hear the announcers, but the announcers are the best. They're like, he caught the ball, he caught the ball. No, he caught the ball. <laughs> Incredible. I love it. Phenomenal, phenomenal. So, for the podcast crowd, I'll, I'll give you the mini play by play. It was a ball hit to the wall, and the center fielder acted like he didn't have it for a while. And dude's rounding the bases thinking he's got a homer absolute celebration city pointing at people like, oh, see you later. I'll see you after the game. Like, <laughs> no play. High five in the third base, coach. <laughs> he's doing Ronald Acuna around the bases. That is good. Somebody's got to do that in the bigs, please. And lastly, this is an early candidate for home run celebration of the year. It's getting very competitive in big league clubhouses or in big league dugouts. What are you going to do? The Orioles funneling water. A water funnel. Frage, rate this one to 10 for us. Two. Not a fan of it. Not a fan what? at all. I got to be honest with you. Really? Too much. Too much, man. Nah, I'm not a fan of that one. I like the hats. I like the claw. I like everything else. This one just a little too much for me. I like the other stuff, though, but this one, uh, I'm not I'm not that big a fan of it. Give me more. I'm, I'm surprised. Why not? What's wrong with it? I mean, it's it's it Trying looks cool, hard? but I... I I, don't, I I think that's what it is. Trying too hard. I just, I don't know, man. You want to put your mouth on something somebody else was on? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not, in, I'm not into that. <laughs> there it is. There's I'm, the line. I'm not, I'm, not in, I'm not into that one. Okay. But not, not, I, I think it's trying too much. Too much. You got to, something's got to come natural, man. You got to find, I mean, is that part of Baltimore's lore? There's got to be something over there, you know, um, something else. Yeah, but we How have, about, we have a, a laundry cart, a big ass hat. That's not like a laundry cart part of Boston. People do laundry everywhere. No. I don't know. I mean, they're they're just running know. out of ideas. Maybe I think it's Run. called Homer Hose. Let's get yeah. ratings one to ten. You don't yeah. like it? It's all right. If they now if they're like pouring beer shots down it, like a beer funnel, then maybe... <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. That would go for <laughs> Red Sox or something <laughs> like that. Kratzy, you don't like it either. Nah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go four, just because I want to go a little higher than Todd. I mean, I think I like the creativity. Eh, like, I don't know what it's promoting. I don't know, like, uh, okay, especially fair. when we show when we show the samurai hat. Like, that was awesome that Otani bought. Like, 
That's that's big time. Not so not a, not the Baltimore University College bomb. I'm going to give you a lock. I think the league's going to squash that. Wow. Okay. How about that? I think the league's going to get word no. of that. They won't get right away. Now but they squash get word it. And they start playing like water pong. They bring out like a ping pong table. That and would be Then we have action. Yeah. It's some beer pong. Be yeah. Beer pong. <laughs> beer pong would be fun. All some right. solo cups. That uh, that's my lock. That that's why I think it'll be gone. I think what what Kratzy's talking about. You're inferring something else. No more uh, dong bong homer hose, whatever they call <laughs> it in Baltimore. <laughs> See you Wednesday. Ugh.